You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. And away we go. We are back, right, Pete? Oh, yeah, we're back. Um, sure. Yes. Oh, sure, for sure. Sure, get Salty Experience Podcast. One of a kind. <laughs> the only Trump one. Play, best in the world. Only one. Brings the firehouse kitchen table to you. Yep, not just FDNY guys. We got other guys coming in too. Boston oh, we're not guys. as good. Back oh, yeah. Boston, Detroit. What happened to the Philly guy? We weren't we supposed to get a Philly guy? I'm the Philly guy. Maybe I'm he fine. got scared. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I tell you, the guy from Jersey City tonight didn't get scared. Nope, yeah, we got him. Good. Yep. Nope. You know who's not scared at all? <clears throat> Your internet. Your internet staying in place. <laughs> Holding you know firm. It. Firm Holding internet. Talk, baby. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm really sad because now I have to retire that key. That key is no longer valid anymore. I have to pull it and put it in another yeah. side. You know, I have to say that usually, you know, I get a lot of these people telling me who to get on the show and all that shit. But mm -hmm. the Chiefs name did come up quite a bit. And then I had to call. I had to go to the to my guy. Who's your guy? Pete, Pete Parker. <clears throat> I had to go to. Oh, PDP. I call him up. Oh, double P, P squared. He gave me he gave me the straight skinny. PP. I gave you the skinny. What's <laughs> the matter P -P with you? He gave it a skinny. He did. Uh, oh. Rangers are you, know got me, you know who got me my uh, internet? The Majestrium actually came here and hooked it up, Pete. Yep. The Majestrium? Oh, hey, you know, what he, you know what he said? Oh That's what he said when he came here. He did. <laughs> He looked at he looked at the old piece setup that I had, and he went like this. Oh my god! And then he fell yeah. through your window, right? And that was it. Yeah. Terrible. And he brought you a vibrator. Then brought and then after, when he brought you the vibrator, he goes, "Gary, <laughs> my god, don't even touch it. Don't even show it. Leave it where it is. It's fine. Don't worry about it." Oh really? my god. Yeah. Oh my it. god. Yeah. We actually, uh, we're uh, we're. We're pretty smooth sailing tonight. There's no, uh, there's no uh, advertisements or anything like that. Good. We're just gonna roll right in, pretty soon. Really, we right got a new advertiser guy. coming on board. I like him. I like the guy. I he's like him guy. too. We're working on yeah. that commercial. You know, I'm trying to find that same voice guy. I know he's. I hear he's booked. So it's a. Uh, wow, he might be tough to get, man. He might be doing a Lucky <laughs> Strike commercial right now. Ah, yes, yeah. Lucky might be, Strike. He might be, uh, doing something for Scott. You know, the guy like this. <clears throat> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. He might be, might be tied up right now. I'm cracking up, but you know what we do? Uh, we do have to tell the folks about. There's a couple things actually, uh, right. and it's not just our usual spiel about ads or whatever. Uh, guys, we gotta, tell, we gotta tell them with Susie Wright's pledge again in the chat. I'm gonna boot her out. That's what she's we gotta fired. Tell she's fired. fired. You're fired. fired. All oh, right, uh, silly woman. <laughs> Shut up. Silly, silly woman. woman. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> silly woman. Oh my god, do I miss yeah. that guy? Uh, uh I will say what? this right, is the message that I have tonight, guys. What is that? Um it is it's it's a little it it boggles my mind that I go to the getting salty fans page and there's over 30,000 and we're at like 24 8 and change over here so guys please like subscribe and share i can't say it enough man like it. it's free you know just you hit the subscribe button if you don't have a youtube account it's a, just your email gmail just just can we make that mandatory if you want to subscribe to the page you automatically have to hit subscribe to youtube can we do it that would somehow? be nice it would what be it? nice maybe mr shup or mr martinez could hook that up for us you know what i mean like it's really, honestly, guys. There's the only one way that this show is going to grow, and we can give you more and more and more and more and more and more and more content, like the uh, mm -hmm. documentary we're working on right now with the uh, squads and stuff like that. If you like, subscribe, and share it. Um, I mean, if you just subscribe alone, that's everything we could yeah, ever I mean, ask. What do you for. think? All this content can be made by its own. Come on, I'm down here, and Louis got me in a slave in a, in a uh, little. He locks the doors when I come down here. You know. Yep. Yep. So that's Where's my spiel. Problem? That's my right. spiel. But also, guys, uh, as always, getting salty apparel .com, where you will find the coolest, best, freshest stuff like this tumbler right here to keep all of your beverages cold and chilly when you're on Long Beach and you're rubbing oil on Kevin's legs and whatnot. Whoa, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What? Did I ever Who do that? that? I never did, lady? never did that. Never I did that. Your old lady did that. Maybe my old lady. That's right. My old lady yeah. was doing that once and then yeah. whatever it was, I got yeah. your keys and you got yeah. mine. Anyway, oh, wow. uh, gettingsaltyapparel.com is where you get the coolest, freshest firefighter apparel and accessories in the game. So if you want to support the show, support us there. Also, guys, 
guys in the super chat. If you absolutely, positively want to support the show and you guys are our number one sponsors, throw a few shekels in there. Just a couple of, you know, a couple of one, two, threes. You know what I'm saying? If not, no problem. No worries. But uh, if you want, if you're feeling generous, that's where to do it. And really, guys, everything makes a difference. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar or if it's whatever. It's all good. We appreciate it. So What's thank you. What's going on, Peter? What's going on, Peter? What's going on, Peter? Oh, yeah. my God. There's a lot of. Uh, somebody uh, was asking uh, about the, the booth numbers for. Uh... FDIC. Uh, no, they were asking for the chief show upstate New York. So we, we're doing all the shows this year, Bo uh, up in uh, up in uh, Boston, and Wor Worcester, Worcester, Worcester. So if you uh, go on the fans page and reach out to my wife, AJ, she usually puts out the booth numbers and where we'll be. So hit her up on the fans page and ask her, and she'll, she'll give you that info. Ask her. Ask her. Yep. All right, let's bring him in. What else you got? Anything else, Swift, before we bring in uh, our luxury? Get his in here. He could be sleeping. Get him in here. Uh, yeah, he's, probably, he's, he's probably asleep by now. I actually, I'm hard looking charging, at He's yeah. nodding out. Poor guy. We got a hard charging Jersey City guy, man. Jersey City does some W to the O R K, bro. Wait till so you let's see bring some him pictures. in. Yeah, Chief Michael Turpak. <laughs> there he is. What's up, Chief? Chief. Hello, shalom. Hi, guys. You sure you want to do this? Right. You sure? Hi. Right. Yeah. I love. I always love the first. I'm already committed. I'm, 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 yes. What'd you say? I should yeah, be committed. I'm, I'm committed. Yeah. <laughs> he had. No, well, at I, least, I at least, no. chief. At least you had a good reputation, right. and that was. That's all you can nah. hang your head on. I got guys reaching out to me. Ziggy, a whole bunch of guys. Uh, saying I, that, I always uh, loved. Yeah. I always loved that back first reaction. Real deal. When they come on, they always look like this. What, like, like what Clint? Like, what the hell am I doing? On yeah. these yeah. idiots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I hit him with the salt of the hit him with the salt of the standpipe, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I had him right there at hello. I had That's him. Right. Yep, salt of the standpipe. What, what was his name again? What they what they call him now? I the Katoris. No, no, but he had oh. a name. They were calling him. That's why I came up with the salt. Oh, the something pipe. that. You said the something. Bro, H2O. Bro, 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 <laughs> bro, bro, H2O. H2O. <laughs> yeah, but they had a name for him. The magician or something, right? The, I forget what they called him. They made it up. I don't remember. Uh, Let's right. concentrate on the guest we got. A hard charger from Jersey City. There he is. Oh, but before we get to that, Pete, we got to get patriotic, bro. Because Sue's going to have a meltdown in there. We gotta ooh, do it. ooh, this is my favorite part of the show. And you know what? Monday, by the way, I want to tell you, before we do this, Monday, I think the girl who won the uh, little thing where he sent them in, people singing the national anthem. I think we may do her live on Monday. What do you think about that? I just reached out to her the other day. She wants to do a live rendition. Oh, fine. What do you think? All, All right, right, yeah. Okay. I'm good. Yeah, I'd love All to right. do that. Sure. All right. Tune That's in for great. that and tune in for the, uh, the, the the chickies, the girls, the calendar girls on Monday. That's what we're doing. All right. Well, in the meantime, we'll have to settle for this old used up version of the pledge but ladies and gentlemen nonetheless the pledge of allegiance i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all Amen, brother. Amen. Gets me every time. All right. One more thing we got to do before we, before we start <laughs> listening to the illustrious career of Chief Turpak, Pete. And what is that? We have to support all the alcoholics in the show. Absolutely. And <laughs> by all means, I would never get in the way of uh, people in their booze. So, ladies and gentlemen, the word of the day is dovetail. Oh, God. <laughs> Anybody know what that means, Ruff? You gonna tell me what that means? I don't. I don't know what it means. I got a couple uh, birds uh, sent me a text. What does that mean, Chief? I know what it means. I know what it means. I know exactly where it means, and I know exactly where it came from too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm already getting texts here already. Uh, <laughs> I'll just say real quick where it came from. I'll just. I'll, I'll just. I'll just get this out of the way. This is either from Johnny Riker in Newark Fire or Danny Sheridan from the Bronx. When we're together and we do a couple seminars together, for some reason I have this affiliation with the word dovetail, dovetail this, dovetail that. 
and those two clowns, one of them had to get in touch with you. Somebody did something. I will find out who they are and I killed them. You might I never hear from them again, but I'll handle this. I thought you were a cow. I'll handle this later today. I promise you. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. He's, he's not just a, a, a kind chief. He's a vengeful chief. I, oh, I like that. I like, I like that. it. Yeah. Kind of oh, well, I had to be Sheridan. I'll is get back the, at is you. That the, is that the chief who dropped like the 80 pounds of coins at us on, on FDIC? Sheridan? Ruffy, we took yes, that was him. Yes, yeah, that's, that's probably, yeah. That's probably, yes. He's a good dude. Probably I like Danny. Him, yeah, why is that? I love that guy. He's a good dude, man. Yep, we're gonna get that guy when he retires yep, too. Yes. We'll All right, now <laughs> let's get into it, Chief. Give us a little background on where you're from originally, where you grew up, a little early, uh, what got you into the fire service, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh God. Uh buh, 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 buh. well, I'll start way back from the beginning. You ready? Here we go. Yeah. Um actually originally from Pennsylvania. I'm originally originally born in Carbondale, PA, outside of Scranton. Uh, moved to Jersey when I was one, mom and dad, of course. Uh, they came out here, more, I guess, more opportunity for employment. And I pretty much knew early on as a young kid, because I used to hang out at the local volunteer firehouse, uh, Little Falls, New Jersey. Shout out to those dudes. And uh, Singac Fire Company 3, as soon as I turned 16, they had what they call like a junior firefighter program. And uh, the day I turned 16, I banged on the door and I said, let me in. And I go, what do I sign? <laughs> and, I, and they were like, not by the hair of a I mean, I swear. Oh, my God. And I got hooked. I mean, I'm sure like everybody, like you guys, I got hooked. And I said, this is this is what I want to do. I'll figure out how to make money at it someplace down the road. And uh, I was a uh, junior guy in the, in the Bollies. Um, and then in 78, I became an auxiliary firefighter uh, in Newark, New Jersey. I worked, uh, I worked, like, you know, it's more like a volunteer type thing, but they had guys that would, you could ride with them on weekends. So I, were, I rode out a three truck on West Market in Hudson with seven engine in the first battalion. I'm sure I know Pete probably knows where that is or where it was because they closed the truck. And then in 81, I got a, I got hired in Jersey City, and I spent 36 years there and loved every single minute of it. I really had a blast. What, what, a great, what, great what, city. What, hell of a fire department. What exactly is an auxiliary, though? What is, what is that? It's kind of like, remember if you remember the old auxiliary CD day, civil defense type guys, you were pretty much volunteer oh. to assist as a first responder. So Newark had an auxiliary firefighter program. That you pretty much, you know, you came in and they interviewed you. And if they liked you, they, you know, they gave you a helmet and a coat and said, you could ride here just to get permission from the company officer. And I just, which, you know, I call. Uh, I asked the captain, I said, listen, is it okay if I come down and ride Sunday? And he said, yeah, come on down. So I would spend the day. And that would be like an extra set of hands. You weren't masking up, you weren't going in the building. It was just kind of more being a buff, but a buff that was able to kick some kinks and, you know, foot a ladder and do some stuff like that. So it was a, it was a blast. I mean, I loved it. I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. So that my uh, junior firefighter, auxiliary firefighter days was kind of like, look at that guy. this is, yeah, yeah. Look, that's an old picture. My God. Who's I that? Mark? I found that picture that for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they had to be that's doing a, that's, there. That's no a long time ago. Right? They were doing oh, work in, Newark, in Newark? Newark? Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Newark was on fire back in the 70s and 80s. I mean, I, a lot of the urban areas in Jersey, I mean, Jersey City was burning quite a bit. Patterson, you know, uh, Camden, everybody was getting a lot of work. It was, a, you know, it was a great, great place to work, Newark, Jersey City, those other cities. And I, I being a Jersey boy, I said, this is the city I want to go to. So that's where I gravitated towards. And Spent a long time there. I had a blast all the way up to the ranks. The, I really you did. Took the test, uh, when did you take the test? How old were you when you, when you were able to take the test? Um, I took it to Jersey City test when I was 20. I got hired just after I turned 21, June of 81. Uh, and we got hired. My class was like 75 guys in that class. And um, 81. And then I think I became a uh, company officer in 92, if I remember correctly. And then a battalion chief a couple of years later, then a deputy chief and ran the shift for probably 12, 13 years right up till the end. Yeah, I had some great, I worked with some great people, some outstanding guys and uh, some great companies. And I was able to see a lot. I mean, to me, I think Jersey City offers a lot because of, um, it's very diverse. 
it's like a mini New York, I used to say. Like we got everything, honestly, that you guys do, but on obviously a much, much smaller scale. I mean, you name it, we have it from high rise, the roll frame, brownstone, taxpayer strip mall, Queen Anne's subway, waterfront. The only thing I think we don't have that you have, obviously, is the airport. But we got everything small, but you got to see a lot, especially the house I was assigned. It was in a great location. So a blast, really a blast. What, it was a lot of fun. Great career. Coops, I missed it. I missed it. Coops, he, he almost got on the FDNY, right? Or he did get on the uh, FDNY. We're going to get to that, but I want to learn, I want to learn a little bit about Jersey City. Like how, how big is the department? How many companies or houses? What what size is that, that department? Oh, uh, the, the staffing has fluctuated over the years. I think right now there are around 700 firefighters uh, out there at work uh, on duty, of course. Uh, EMS is a separate entity. It's a private contractor. Um, they are EMS based, meaning the guys and gals are, I think they're EMT trained, first responder trained. Uh, but we don't do transports. We don't have that type of um, organization under our umbrella. So about mm -hmm. 700 firefighters, I think they're roughly around 28 or 29 companies now. Again, that number has gone, oh, my God, it's, I think 800 plus to as low as 500 up and down, depending on wow. who the mayor was and what kind of money they would allocate. But about 700 currently right now citywide. And how do they how do they ride on a rig? How many get on an engine? How many get on a, on a ladder? How does that work? Um, yeah, minimum staffing is a one in three. It's an officer and three on each piece. Uh, the rescue and the squad, uh, there's only one uh, one rescue, one squad. They were one in four minimum. And I think obviously on a good day, they can go up to one in four, one in five, depending on the staffing. But a minimum of one in three, that was, you know, that was a decent, uh, that was an average day, I should say, not a decent day uh, on staffing. So Chief, what how, how, how big is it compared to like Newark? Is, you know, I don't, I'm, I've never been in Jersey City. How big is the city? You know, like uh, how many firehouses do you have? How big is it compared to Newark? I think Newark's a little bit bigger than us geographically. I mean, they, don't forget they got the airport out there. And I think our staffing is very similar to theirs. I think we have around roughly the same amount of staffing, seven plus 750, 700, give or take. I think we're very similar. Excuse me, houses, I'm going to say 17, 18 houses. I think what's unique for us is a little bit is um, we got about 300,000 residents, you know, 300,000 that we know about, of course, right. and about 14 <laughs> square miles. So that's that's I mean, that's our footprint. I mean, it's it's a, it's pretty densely populated. So, um, I mean, you have building on top of building similar to everything that you have, of course. But uh, 300,000 people, 14 square miles. So there's a you know, that's pretty well packed. I, that's the challenge I think we have. Isn't, and the well, um, as well as the building diversity, isn't isn't, isn't Jersey City considered like the the uh, sixth borough uh, as well? Don't they often say that about Jersey City? Yeah, I've heard that before. I um, mean, we've actually heard that before. <laughs> that was kind of like the ongoing. I don't want to say uh, conversation or joke, but they were like, it was like, yeah, we were like the sixth borough. We were, of course, for you guys, we, and maybe some of your listeners don't know, we're right across the river from Lower Manhattan in, in, the, in Brooklyn. So we're connected to, you know, Manhattan via the Holland Tunnel. And, uh, you know, we got the water taxi, the subway system that connects us to Manhattan. So we're very close to you guys. And, of course, you know, uh, we've mirrored a lot of our, our standard operating guidelines, some of them you know, to a certain degree to what you guys have done. The only thing is we don't have as many people per rig. And obviously, they don't have anywhere near the number of apparatus. But... You know, for in one and three on each piece, I, in my experience, I think they, you know, they got a set of balls. They get the job done. They really do, honestly. Yeah. Doing doing more with less. <clears throat> That's the thing that seems to be the theme yeah, in the country. Absolutely. We're used to, uh, you know, knocking it out with uh, eight thousand guys at a job, and they're uh, <laughs> now they're doing one and three. Killer so, manpower. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the squad, the squad, the rescue you have there. What's the difference between those two? You, have, you said you have one squad and one rescue? Well, they're, they're, yeah, one squad, one rescue. Uh, they're in the same house. I mean, uh, pretty much they uh, watch this word. They dovetail off of each other. All right. Hey. So uh, they work pretty much in unison. Hello. Nice. I've been waiting. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting to say that word. That's one, you know, I timed that perfectly, <laughs> that word. You know that. Uh, Great job. Uh, that's fun. 
Nice. Uh, but they have, obviously, they have the squad and the rescue have the same capabilities outside of the tool caches. Obviously, the rescue carries a little bit more equipment. The end of squads is like an enhanced engine, of course. But they're trained to the same level regarding extrication, high angle, you know, collapse. Uh, they work extremely well together. Two very good companies. Um, when those guys were coming down the block, quite honestly, I knew the fire was going out. I really just, you had that confidence. And I'm sure you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. They got the job right. done. <clears throat> now, did they turn out, for, how did they do it with fires? Did they both wind up at the box at a, at a job? Or did they, they share the boxes? Or they go to different Well, boxes? that's been... Yeah. Yeah, that that goes back and forth a little bit, you know, depending on who's writing the standard operating guideline that year. I mean, when I was in the rescue, um, we went out on every reported fire citywide and even any order of smoke. So we were going out the door quite a bit when I was there. You know, you're, you're doing about your easy 3,500, 4,000 runs a year. And we didn't go on any bullshit runs. I mean, we were going to AF, no AFAs. Uh, Nothing, nice. you know, nothing that didn't require a full box. Uh, it was only nice. full boxes. So going out the door, there's a high, <laughs> yeah, there's a high chance you were going to work. Yeah, it was a good, good chance you're going to work. Okay. Now I'm not sure if they changed policy and how they do things. But, yeah. And what about but, yeah, the squad? We, uh, you're going the out the door. You pretty much <clears throat> squad. The, the same squad. Thing uh, the squad had. Well, the, the thing about the squad was it was an engine, obviously. So they would pick up any of the first two boxes in their area. Uh, on a, you right. know, a reported fire, you get four engines, two trucks to rescue and a battalion. And if the uh, squad was on one of the four engine boxes there, they would go out the door and they would act as an engine. If there was anything outside of their first alarm response area, they would go uh, on the uh, working fire or the all hands and they come in as an additional engine and they would plug holes in the dam, I would say. Either they yeah. would come in and act as an engine. They come in and act as a truck. Uh, they can work with the with the rescue and do some additional stuff for those guys. So they had a lot of flexibility outside of their first two response area. Again, another great company because, I mean, very diversified. <clears throat> and again, they would go citywide too. They would actually go citywide. Uh, more or less, the senior guys go there. The senior companies in, in the uh, rescue squad. Yeah, well, uh, when we first, the long story short on the rescues, um, we used to have two rescues back in, in the 60s and 70s. And, of course, you know, one brilliant mind at City Hall decided to close both the rescues in one shot. Uh, oh, wow. and we didn't have a rescue back in the city until 91. <laughs> yeah, Holy it's crazy. Shit. Smart uh, they reopened Rescue 1. Yeah, well, you know, a little couple of assholes, no, no doubt. But... Um, they reopened Rescue One and it went out for pretty much you had to submit a resume and you had to get picked by the captains. And it was all based on your skill set. You know, if you had some trade background, your years of service, no blemishes on your record. So when we reopened the rescue, it was all based on all seniority and, of course, your resume. Now it pretty much comes down to you can get into those both of those companies based on seniority. So, again, you got to be able to, you know, you got to be on an engine or truck for a number of years and you come in, you got to call the officer to make sure it's okay to put the bid in. If the officer of the company gives you the blessing, then you come in. Huh. And do the rescue and squads work back and forth in either company or rescue guys in the rescue squads in the squad? No, the rescue and squad, they go across the floor. They kind of, they work back and forth nicely together. Yeah, if uh, the rescue's got a spot, a squad guy will fill in, so on and so forth. So they're pretty well in tune to each other's, you know, skill sets, who needs to fill a void. Yeah, everything within the same house for the most part, for the most part. That's pretty city, interesting, city. right, Rob? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does, uh, does the city still have a lot of vacants? You know, no, not like we used to. Um I've, I remember correctly, I remember it was in the 80s, early 80s, they had put a published, um, I guess the, the city wasn't doing well back in the 80s. Uh, you know, obviously, it was not a good time for the urban areas on, on the probably either side of the Hudson. I remember seeing something in one of the local papers, and this might not be a big number to you guys, but for a city of about 14 square miles, we had about over 10,000 vacants way back when. I remember seeing that published. And that number now is probably under a thousand. I would say probably even closer to five hundred now, for the simple reason. Wow. And um, and this is factual, obviously. Uh, we got discovered, Jersey City, and the, actually yeah, the whole yeah. waterfront yeah, of Jersey. It's so down, down, man, down there. On the water, it's on the water. Oh, yeah, right? popping yeah. down there. Yeah. yeah. Great view of the city, probably. Right. Yeah, I mean. Oh, it's it's spectacular. I mean, back in the eighties, uh, <laughs> I mean, back in the eighties, if you had a couple bucks. 
you had a crystal ball and you had a set of balls, you could have bought a <laughs> row of vacant brownstones for backpacks. <laughs> Oh my yeah. God! Oh my God. I, I mean, I'm not kidding you. They were giving away, they were giving away burnt out brownstones down on Montgomery Street. I'll never forget this. I mean, for like five, six thousand dollars, you could pick them up. And yeah. I remember this. I'll never forget this. I was down there. We were. I was at a fire, and I remember I was a kid. I was 21, 22. I remember saying, "Who the hell would want to live down here? This is a dump <laughs> today." Not a, today. a sip of cappuccino. Yeah, not a sip of cappuccino. <laughs> oh my now. God. I, I wish I wish I had a little vision and a couple bucks. I mean, they're multi-million dollar brownstones. It's actually a drop that gorgeous area. And I, you know, the reason yeah. we got discovered, I don't have to tell you, is um, and people cannot afford. Not everybody, of course, but a fair amount of people couldn't afford to pay the rent or leasing for Manhattan or Brooklyn. So the next best thing was to come to Jersey City or Hoboken, and they can live in Jersey and but work in New York and take the subway, take the water taxi, you know, do what they had to do and get back and forth and save a few bucks. And, you know, and have the New York lifestyle, but live at night, sleep at night, saving a few dollars on rent on the Jersey side. Right, so right, 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 that's right. why we boomed up as much as we have. And it continues yeah. to this day. It really does. Yeah, it's a it's a hot place to be down there, man. It was absolutely. Let's yep. talk about the, yep. when you got to engine 10 and ladder 12. Oh, are they in this, no, yeah, they're in the same house, right? 10 and 12? They were the back to back? Yeah, yeah, 10 and 12. So they, yeah, same house, um, a great house. Now, would that, would that be known as the, the Valley, Valley of Death? Death? Ah, I had it on a city, yeah. the Valley yeah, of Death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you did and your what? research, huh? I like that. I like uh, that. Yeah, it was, used yeah. to be called the Valley of Death. Well, well, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, back in the 80s, like the, every company was kind of, you know, rediscovering, you know, what their, their, their patches, whatever they wanted to put on the rig or the logo. And myself and a couple other guys, a good friend, Jim Drennan, and one of my mentors, great guy, uh, he's since passed away, Frankie Salerno. We came up with this idea of uh, naming the firehouse 10 and 12, the Valley of Death and Destruction. Now, um, when we put into the chief of department to get the okay to have this logo patches and stuff on the start of the rig, he, he freaked the hell out. He didn't want to hear anything <laughs> about the Valley of Death. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and we, I tell you quite honestly, the reason we did that is um, that particular area, the 10 engine 12 truck was a, it was a great house. I was able to get that house out of the academy. A friend of mine got me the house. Huh. And the reason he said that yeah, I should go there as a young firefighter, it was um, it was right on the cusp of three different battalions. It was on, we were in the fourth battalion, but we were also on the cusp of the first and the second. And this house picked up a lot of first alarm boxes in the fourth, the first and the second. And those three battalions at that time, they were they were burning. So we were getting some good exposure down there. But I'll go back to the Valley of Death. We experienced a lot of, you know, there was a lot of civilian deaths in that area. I, I think, if I remember correctly, I think the first year, and you got to realize, you know, we're not as ge geographically big as some, but I think we had like 35 or 38 civilian deaths the first year I was on a job. Wow. And then the next year, another 35, 36, 30. And, that, you know, that was a lot of exposure right away. And that's how the nickname came. And, and this, the chief of the department said, absolutely not. You're not put. So eventually we did get it. Uh, you know, we got the okay to call it the Valley of Death. But we didn't call it the Valley of Death and Destruction. <laughs> and I'll tell you simply why. Um, uh, first of all, the, the Valley of Death and Destruction, we couldn't fit the word destruction on the company patch. There was just too many letters. <laughs> so we had to narrow it down to the Valley of Death. And yeah, that's a picture of the house, great house. That's an old house. It was like in 1887 or something like that. Uh, a Mac and a, a American La France teller behind that. And then the kitchen was behind that. Right. It was a great house, but I'm going to tell you, it was also a shithole. It was, uh, it was horribly, <laughs> you know, it was just falling apart. It was a disaster. Right. It was an absolute disaster. That's why the dog's laying outside. a great outside. house to work in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The yeah. dog's like, it stinks in there, man. I ain't going in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that? Is that yellow yeah, dog? We had brown dog and black dog the other day. Is that yellow dog? What's his name? <laughs> yeah, I think I forget. I forget what the name of the dog was. Um, I want. I forget. I really do forget the name of the dog. But I actually took that picture uh, one summer oh, day. Oh, did you? But the dog just. Yeah, I took that a long, long, long time ago. 
And uh, yeah, the dog, he didn't come in the kitchen too often because the kitchen was, uh, it was not, a, it was hole. a clean place, but it was not a clean place. Yeah, it was a shit hole. It was a shit hole. Yeah. yeah. I, could, I could tell you stories about the kitchen. I know, some, I really I know something about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It looks like a true, it looks like a ghetto firehouse, man. Oh, look at that guy. Look at that mustache. Oh, oh yeah, my God. Huh. What you yeah, doing? that was a picture with my buddy doing? Tommy Zinnick. I'm surprised he's not there. Are you doing porn films on the side? With yeah, that's an old, that's a, man. That's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bow chicka wow, wow. That must so last in last too long. How many uh, companies had the uh, slime green rig there? Just you guys? Actually, we used to, oh, no, I think uh, the, the whole city was, uh, it was actually Canary Yellow, to be quite honest, quite honest with you. Like a taxi was cab it? yellow. I, I don't know who came up with that. Yeah. The whole city when I came on was all yellow engines, trucks, chiefs, and uh, really, it lasted I don't know six, eight, ten years. Yeah, wow, it did last that yeah. long, huh? Holy we shit. went back, yeah, yeah, we went back to red, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s. It was a guy said, I guess, that one of the commissioners at the time, one of the chiefs, had this brilliant idea let's go yellow, let's be different, and uh, we were different, there's no doubt about that. I mean, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a fun time, and you know. Uh, good old CF Mac there. I think that's a 71 or a 73 Mac, if I remember correctly. But, yeah, some good stuff. Cool rigs. Well, they got out the door. They pumped. They rotted away, but they pumped water. There's no doubt about yeah. it. What, what's good... that other picture there, Petey? That other 10 engine. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the, the yellow uh, the yellow rig. Nice. There he is. Yeah. It had a mustache. There it... So you got any good fire yeah, stories yeah, the from mustache, uh, 10 engine? Right. When you were I, there? I, I think he does. Check this out. I, I think this might be a good fire. <laughs> Wait, a minute. Wait a minute. That looks like this. And give us that one, Chief. Yeah, I was food on a stove, that one. <laughs> that's, that's how I, I was food on the stove. <laughs> Thought I smelt it. <laughs> wow. So were you working That for was a kick ass fire. That was, yeah. Um, I was still a fireman at the time. I remember coming into this thing. This is a monster. My God. Uh, I think I was, we were four to a 10 engine. And this was a eight or nine story heavy timber that spread to, I think, two or other eight or nine story heavy timbers. And it was a monster, fifth alarm plus. And then I think I remember the buffs saying this to me. And I remember this to some degree that these, the brands, this is a heavy timber building, obviously. The brands from this actually came, went across the river. And I think it actually started a fire in Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, shit. Nice. So we got the whole. <laughs> We got the we got almost the whole tri-state area involved with this one. We wanted to share nice. the experience with this freaking thing. This was a, nothing like sharing yeah. the love. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, yeah. This was a good one. Uh, this. Wow. Did you save the foundation yeah. or? Yeah. What? <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I save it. Much, I, you know, I. I I think this was the this is all this is all former waterfront property. So I think this was part of the urban renewal, if you know what I mean. This probably had a little yeah. hamburger ah, helper sprinkled on it. I there. see what you're saying. Because they yeah, had the little was, uh, they had the little purple streamers, the little purple streamers coming down from the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. This had a little help, I think. I really do. Yeah. Good one. Real good one. Impressive yeah. to say the least. Yeah. What what does it take to put Something besides the tower ladders, which I just learned on the last episode, how much time, like how much effort, what goes into putting out something like this, man? Time and water. Yeah. Well, and, and, and back well, everything away. Then you did not with headlines. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, quite honestly, I know you guys notice. I mean, your objective with something like that was to keep the fire confined to the zip code. You're not putting this freaking thing out. You're not getting <laughs> yeah. anywhere near this thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, this is all about you know, yeah, protecting as much them. as you can and attracting. Yeah, I mean, this thing is this is this is creating its own weather for Christ's sake. You're not yeah. doing anything. Keeping, with this. Yeah. this is you're keeping, the, uh, keeping the rigs out of the collapse zone and uh, <laughs> lob yeah. some water from far away. Yeah. <laughs> That's about. Oh yeah. It. yeah. And did it all? Did it all yeah. Uh, yeah. collapse yeah. ultimately? Oh yeah, this was down probably within five, you know, four or five hours. It was down on the ground, and uh, it was just pretty much, you know, trying to prevent it from moving to other buildings. What you did, it came it actually burnt across that catwalk there into another exposure, another big timber across the street. So uh, oh, we had our hands full, to say the least. Oh yeah, yeah, very like one of those. You know, there's always those fires that you always remember, and this is one of them. Yeah, you, I remember a couple, quite a few, but this was definitely one. 
Yeah. Was it like in January too? Sailors. That would have been great if it was like in January and you froze your balls <laughs> off there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, actually, if I remember, I think this was in the summertime. If, I mean, I'm sure the buffs could correct me if I'm wrong. This was this was not a cold weather fire by any stretch. No, All right. No, I wouldn't God. remember that too. Yeah. Warm, yeah, warm weather, no doubt. But a good one. Definitely something in the in the uh, in the archives. Yeah. Yeah. Any other good fire stories from uh, Ten Engine down in, back in the day there? Well, I'll tell you one that kind of you know it's it's a little humorous if I could say it. Um, I remember when oh, I was yeah. um, when I worked in Ten and oh. yeah, Ten and Twelve. I, you know, I go back across the floor every year just to kind of learn the disciplines between the engine and truck. And I remember as a probie, uh, you know, they sisted me up with this guy. I mentioned him earlier. He was a great mentor. His name was Frankie Salerno, an older gentleman. But he took me under his wing. And I, I never forgot this far. I really don't tell this story too often, but it's, I think it's a pretty good story. Um, we were downtown in the 1st Battalion. We were picking up from fire, and they give us another one. And it was right around the corner. We were first to We were ahead of the engine. And we got into the block, and it was a, uh, it was a top floor of a brick tenement if i remember but it was definitely a top floor fire so the, what i remember about this is um, myself and frank the senior man were working our way up to the top floor and the, the top floor is lit up a little bit and i'll never forget this um i haven't told the story a long time uh there was a lady i heard her screaming and she's coming making the turn on the top landing and she's coming down all right, like a freight train she's got a kid hanging on her back she's got a kid underneath her arm I think she had a TV underneath the other arm, and she was kicking a suitcase down the stairs. <laughs> Played soccer. Yeah, I'm, listen, I'm not making I'm not making any part of this stuff. <laughs> Here's the thing that I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a probie, right? And she's coming down. She's square with me, and I'm frozen solid. And uh, Frankie, the senior man behind me, takes me and he pins me against the wall and she comes blown past me and knocks my helmet off. I think the TV fell, whatever it may be, right? She gets past me screaming and she's out the door and I pick up my helmet and Frankie says to me, as simple as I'm going to say this to you guys, he said, kid, she's been to more fires than you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and he ain't lying. <laughs> he ain't lying. <laughs> that, was, that was the time. That was like when everybody used to get relocated. They get burnt out and they get relocated, get burnt out, get relocated. Yeah, they gave them so money to get relocated. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. So uh, she was she was coming out the door and she would have took me out and he <laughs> oh, pushed me against the with wall. All her I was gonna I was gonna say, Chief, oh. she probably like took you by your collar and said, It's down here, kid. Two door two doors on the left, you know, it's in the back yeah. room. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Follow me. Yeah. yeah. Grab the cord on yeah. the TV and follow yeah. me. <laughs> by the way, I think you're gonna need your halligan to get in. <laughs> Oh my God! So, yeah, if you don't have a halogen, I got one with me. I got one in my bag. Give me my halogen. Yes, yeah. my suitcase. Uh, make sure you give it back, though. Everyone's always taking my tools. Oh man, that's good stuff. Oh God. Yeah, that so, was. You work, mean, uh, that was, that was a you, good one. On there. Oh. You work in the engine on the truck there, or just the engine? No, I did engine and truck. Uh, it was a great house. I would talk, I would do a year in the engine, and I would I would transfer across the hall to the truck, and then vice versa. I probably did that for the better part of 10, 11 years, and then I got the spot in the rescue when the rescue reopened up in '91, and I, I went to the rescue as a fireman. I loved it. A great company. Uh, if there's something that was going on, we were there, and mm -hmm. I worked there until I had the opportunity to get promoted as a company officer. Then I got the spot at 17 engine. I worked at 17 as a captain, which is another great house. Great house. Chief, so, yeah, yeah, engine and truck back and forth. Oh, I really. Yeah, how go did you do that? You, you could go back for a year at a time, back and forth if you wanted. Yeah, what they did each year, they would uh, they would publish the openings. Uh, they call them, and then you could bid a spot based on seniority. You could bid anywhere you want, but was, you had to be a senior person in, uh, to get the spot. So. I was I had the opportunity that you know it was a little senior each year. I would go to engine ten for a year. If the truck had a spot. I would go to the truck for a year or maybe a year or two, and then back to the engine. It was all based on seniority. Once a year you could move. Once a year you can go. That's pretty cool. It's a good idea, man. Yeah, a lot of flexibility. Yeah, flexibility, which was nice. Yeah. yeah. 
Chief, I wanted to ask you, I had to talk to you earlier in the uh, pre-show. Kenneth Simone had messaged us uh, that, uh, yeah. I guess this was 1989, September 1989. His father was uh, was on the job and uh, was a line of duty death. And he said that yeah. you were at that job or you worked at the job or worked on him at the time. I, don't, I wasn't too sure how it went, went exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, a great story, a little emotional story. Um, Simone, Simone is a big name in Jersey City Fire Department. We have a couple of big family names, uh, the Simones, the Drennans. Um, I have a younger brother who just retired our 11 truck. Uh, actually, you had to retire, got caught in a collapse last year, so he's lucky he got out, but you know, he's out. But the Simones was a pretty big family name, and I'll tell you a quick, the quick story that Kenny had brought up to you. Um, I was detailed one night to Nine Engine. Um, and his dad was the captain of Nine Engine. He had a tremendous reputation. And Nine Engine was and continues to be the, the busiest engine in the city. They do a lot of running around, catch a lot of work. Um, and Kenny and his brother Howie, who are currently now battalion chiefs, were not on the job at the time, but they were buffs. They would run, they would catch, you know, they would be have their little scanners and they'd be all throughout Jersey City and they would catch fires and try to get photos of their dad and, you know, other, other people, of course. So uh, long story short, back then we used to work 10s and 14s, 10 hour day, 14 hour night. Now that everything's 24 hour shifts. But I remember I worked the details. I was a 14 hour night. I was at night engine. And I remember that we were pretty busy. We had you know, quite a few runs, maybe 12, 13 runs, no work. But then we caught some work. It was in the middle of the night, first though. Um, and it was a vacant building. You know, it was sticking out a few windows. We were first though. We, I, you know, I had the nozzle. We came in, it was rolling out, you know, quite a few windows, came in the front door, made the turn. And as I was, you know, working the nozzle around, um, uh, just don't, I want to get, don't want to get emotional with this, but I remember this. I remember there was somebody fell over my shoulder and it was Captain Simone. So immediately, you know, I, most of the fire was knocked, put the line down and everybody's on top of the captain and we're dragging the captain out. You know, I got one leg, somebody's got a leg, somebody's got an arm, we're bringing them out. And Kenny, uh, ironically, was there taking pictures of the fire. And as we pull him out and we start to work on him, I can remember this. I was actually telling this story for the first time in years at Christmas. I don't know how the hell it came up at Christmas time. But I can remember his whiskers around my mouth because I was doing mouth to mouth. And Kenny was there taking oh pictures, God. and he didn't realize it was his dad. Ugh. And he actually said this. This is where it's a little, a little emotional. He yelled to me because he realized his dad. And he yelled, and I'm gonna, I don't want to break down. He goes, he goes, Mike, don't let my dad die. And I'm, oh I'm trying to concentrate on my breaths and the compressions. So to make a long story short, we pick up his dad. You know, we get him in the ambulance. Of course, I jump in the ambulance. We take him to the medical center. And they, you know, Jersey City Medical Center, to me, is second to none. And they worked on him and worked on him and worked on him. And then Kenny comes into the ER. And he looks at me. And I said, you just, I said, Kenny, just call your mom. He goes, how's my dad? I go, just call your mom. Just get your mom down here. And he, he passed away. He passed away that night. And uh it's it was a tough night it's a, a story i don't tell that often uh, i'm actually i'm glad that he called you and he gave him permission for me to say the story or give the story it's you know a couple of line of duty deaths i had the misfortune of being involved with uh, that was one of them but it was a very personal one because he was a superstar of a gentleman he had a reputation that was second to none and it was the firefighting family but the worst part of the story his son was there taking pictures of oh, my pictures god of his dad yes. Yeah, passing away. It was a tough night, but uh, something you never forget. But the man is, uh, he's hes on the top of my list as one of the best of the best. The, the whole family, to be quite honest with you, because the whole Simone family, great people. I mean, and then you think that the two boys, they get on the job and they go through the ranks and now yeah. they're the chiefs and, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, both. It's, uh, it's good stuff. You know yeah. what I mean? It's good stuff. Yeah. I mean, in the whole scheme of things, unfortunately. No, but, uh, yeah. The kid who was taking the pictures yeah. became. And they're the carrying on. Both of them. Yeah, oh, wow. and Kenny, who was taking Kenny, who was taking the pictures, became a chief, and his brother Howard is also a battalion chief. But Kenny was taking the pictures. He's now a battalion chief. Yep. Wow. Is that how it is uh, over there? Carrying too? on like, the tradition. Lot, I was yeah, say, absolutely. A lot, a lot of fathers and sons. A lot of in the family. You know. Yes. It's City. A, yeah. There's a lot of family. Yeah, there's a lot of family tradition. Uh, the Drennans that I mentioned before, a lot of great uh, friends. Uh, Kenny Drennan, my, one of my best buddies, Jimmy Drennan, Mike Drennan. 
um, a big family. I think at one time there was like 14 of them on the job um, all together. Wow. Yeah, uncles, brothers. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> and then the Simone brothers. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of fathers and sons and, you know, sisters of, sis, you know, a lot of sister, sister type things. And, um, yeah, this seems like to be, it's, it's, it's a very traditional fire department in that sense that they, everyone tries to get family members on to carry the tradition on, you know, be a Jersey City guy or gal. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think that's that, throughout the country, yes, really. Yes. That's good stuff. Yeah, man. absolutely. 100%. Thank you yep, for sharing yep. that. Yeah. I no, no, no. Thanks for asking. Thanks, thanks to Kenny. Chief, I can't help but ask. You know, um, that's a that's a very hard thing to carry. Um, you know, for you, you know, being in that scenario, you know, like uh, we just did a show on mental health. You know, like a couple of days ago, a couple, you know, like last week. And uh, I'm wondering, like, how did you guys deal with that stuff throughout the years? You know, like carrying those kinds of thoughts and memories. Um, you know, what, what 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 would you say compared to now? What was the culture back then? Well, I mean, I mean, back then, I mean, you know, back in the, the 80s, and 90s, there was no such thing as critical incident stress debriefing. You know, critical incident stress debriefing was when you got out of work at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. yeah, you want know. You went to the local gin mill and everybody, yeah. and you had egg sandwiches and drank, you know, for four or five hours, and then you vetted everything, and then you, you went back to work at six p.m. that night back then, and that was that was it. That's how you dealt with it. I mean, as I mentioned to you, we had a lot of um in that little pocket that I worked, you know, a lot of civilian deaths. I mean, I remember one time turning a corner at seven a.m. and you know, and this. I mean, we've had. I, I was exposed to a couple of civilian deaths, but I remember one morning, you know, six dead kids, and it was like, holy shit! How do you process this one? I mean, you know, you, the smoke clears and they're up there and they're, they're stuck together. One stuck on the windowsill, and you're like, what the freak? How the fuck do I get through yeah. this day? You know, and. Yeah. You know, again, I was relatively young. You go to the gym, though. I mean, that's what you did. And, and, and you just processed it that way. Now, obviously, you don't need to do that anymore. You shouldn't do that anymore, of course. But, yeah. you know, you got through it. Uh, some people got through it. Some people didn't get through it. And uh, you process it. And, um, you know, it worked out to the point where, you know, it didn't become a, a habitual type thing. So, thank God. But that was it. Right. I don't have to tell you guys. I'm sure you, you and, kind and of guys, you guys invented the same way. Guys generally looked out for one another, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have to tell you guys the same thing across the river. I mean, we're no different. Absolutely, one, no, no different at all. It's uh, it's the same job. The laws of physics don't differ on one side of the Hudson to the other. It's the same damn thing. Uh, you know, you, you see work, you, you do it. You deal with work. Uh, obviously, there's things, the traditions there, the mentoring is there. You know how you how you deal with your probies is there. Um, you latch on to the senior people, you hang on their coattails, they share, you know, nozzle experience, you know, when to take glass, when to take the skylight, you time things, you listen to radios and, uh, yeah, it's, it's the profession continues. And if anything, it should be getting better because obviously years ago we didn't have, you know, I remember we didn't have, we didn't mask up first engine, never masked up back then. All the Scots were these big, you know, torpedo cylinders, as you know, way back there, the mask with the hose. They were in a, they were in a freaking box. Yeah. Oh, my God. They were in a suitcase. <laughs> or they were in a compartment. They were in the compartment, you know. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. This was funny. Um, Not funny, but we'll talk about making change. As I mentioned, I was in 10 engine. And kind of an unwritten rule, the first engine would push the line in with no mask on. You would push it as far as you could. You know, you would take a beating as much as you could. And then the second engine, they pretty much masked up and took the line over and finished off the room, <laughs> the hallway, whatever it was. Great. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. I tell you, I was in 10 engine. We had some young guys and 20 engine, a great company up the street is to take our line. And I got said, came back after a few fires. And I said to some of the guys in 10 engine, I go, this shit ain't happening no more. I said, we're never giving up at the freaking line. <laughs> so what we would do is um, we would at eight o'clock in the morning or six o'clock at night, depending on the shift change, I would take the Scott out of the freaking box. I would put it into the jump seat. Now the jump seats had no clips. So I would just put it in the jump seat and you had to run. I would just lean into the Scott. And if they tapped on the window, we were going to work, you know, I just put the straps on and I get off. And I was masked up as nobody was taking the line. 
But when the shift ended, some of this older guys from the different shifts, they would come in and they say, yo, they look at me, go, kid, come here, put that thing back in a box. All right, put it back in a freaking box. I go, well, you don't understand. You can, you don't have to give up the line. And they go, we don't want to hear that shit. Put it back in the box. So Just I kept doing it. I kept bleeping. I would, <laughs> oh, I didn't want to piss them off. But yeah, yeah. Nice. So eventually, you know, so eventually they didn't put it back in the box because I would get out at you know eight six o'clock in the morning, uh, six o'clock in the evening. I'd be I'd be booking there. I'd be going someplace out drinking with the guys because I was a young guy. And they go, yeah, that freaking Turpak, he left his mask in the jump seat again. And they <laughs> didn't want to put it back. They would leave it there. And eventually they started to lean into it. Using too it. And yeah, yeah. They mask up. And it was kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was kind of like a, it was like it became our mandatory mask rule like without having paperwork to say it's a mandatory mask rule. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we kind of introduced it ourselves. Uh, giving up the line, that shit stopped pretty damn quick. Yeah, then it happened again. You know? I heard they so, called that the Turpak. Yeah. Thing. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> but I'll tell you, you what, know, it, it 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 did dovetail into a mandatory mask oh, rule. Oh, oh, hey. Hey. Oh. hey Chief, uh actually they're saying one of your rules was keep the stairs clear and get control of those exit points. That was your pet peeves. That's not a bad, uh, oh, bad no, I got a lot of pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> no way. I, got a lot of I think that was Freddie Lafamina's too. Keep guys off it the stairs. It was. Remember? Well, stay yeah. off the stairs. The stairs is always a pain in the ass. Always, yeah. always, always a pain in the ass. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not only the stairs but on the, from the fire floor down. It's the goddamn front stairs, you know, walking into the building as the truck's forcing the door. I'm like, is this a union contract thing? There's a fireman <laughs> signed to every step. I got to clean the step. <laughs> we got to get close, Chief. We got to get close. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Nice. Yeah, you know, Rook, we had a couple you, I mean, of experiences. Uh, we had a couple of old time no, guys who, uh, who said that. Uh, uh, I forget who it was actually. A couple of guys who said that the nozzle man in the backup didn't take a mask, but then the two other guys would take a mask. That way, they would let their own guys take a beat, and then they would move up on the line. Right. And, so they, uh, they wouldn't have. So to they give wouldn't up have the to line. give up the line. Yeah. Right. I don't remember who that was. I don't either. Yeah. Yeah, no, we never did that. We didn't have that many guys. Either you pushed it and took care of the fire, or you pushed it and gave it up. And this give it up concept went bye bye real damn quick. Really did. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. like it. Yeah. I just had a question. Yeah. I remember what the hell I was going to say. Well, I, 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 I start studying. I, I mean, he became a chief here. Yeah. Well, I, Way I did, before, before that. We, before we get to the chief thing, actually, I wanted to ask you. You did send us a few shots of these interesting rigs you have. Uh, Here's one of them. Oh my God. Explain this monster. It's a snorkel. <laughs> I thought it was a snorkel too. Uh, this, I, you know, I, I was watching the one podcast when you had the chief from Detroit on, and he had some pictures of some old rigs. This was we used to call this the EP. Obviously, it's an elevating platform. It was a snorkel truck. I think it was 95 footer. It was the scariest looking fire truck I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> And the reason I say that the boom, the boom would come around the corner ten minutes before the rest of the rig. I, mean, I, mean, I was gonna say, that. look how far out in front of that thing yeah. is. Oh my god! Well, well, if you look, there's actually a light on the front to let people know they were making the turn. I mean, there's, I mean, this was big. I mean, Oh shit! And that's freaking awesome. It was assigned. To, it was assigned to six truck. Is it was in the downtown area, and I believe it, colla it collapsed. It actually fell over twice, and I think one time it fell over. There was guys in the bucket, and they perfectly oh, timed. They jumped out of the bucket and landed and <laughs> rolled on the roof of the building. Was that one of those? No like shit. Like a circus Olay type thing. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Crazy. I, yeah, oh, it was the scariest thing I ever saw in my life. It was on duty when I got on a job in the '80s. It was it was wild looking. It didn't last too long in the 80s, but I guess when it worked, it worked. But most times it was more scary and didn't work. You know, one of those type of scenarios. You know? And we have another uh, sort of bright idea here. What's this one? <laughs> I'm not really sure what this freaking thing is. No, I do know what it is. Um, <laughs> this, um, this was um, way back in every Jersey City engine. Uh, all they had was, you know, two and a half inch hose or a three inch hose where they would actually, you know, drop both lines to supply another company, whether it was another engine or a tarot ladder. 
So once you've had the idea that, you know, this was going to be the hose reel, this would come in, I think, in all second alarms. And it was five inch hose on a reel. That's really what that's all it was. And they would come into a second alarm and back into the block and then dump five inch out and go out and get a hydrogen and sister up with an engine and push five inch water to the front of the fire building when we didn't have anything bigger than two and a half or three inch supply lines. So this is how they pretty much introduced five inch hose to the city. And now this is obviously gone way gone this is a long time ago so now every engine in the city uh, carries five inch supply line that's uh, that's how we drop water it's everything's five inch uh, to and from hydrants and engines back and forth so the hose reel truck the hrt i think it was called and uh this is another thing that came down the block and i'm like somebody explain this one to me so i can figure <laughs> this out <laughs> they did yeah. well, it had a place it really did have a place it, Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, well, then you have this one more here from the FDNY former FDNY uh, uh, rig here. What's this? Oh, this is a great picture. Um, this picture was uh, from a good friend, Ron Jeffers. Uh, he's one of the uh, the local photographers, a great friend of the JCFD. Uh, long story short, when I first started, we had eleven ladders on duty, eleven ladder companies, and every one of the ladders, except for that monster snorkel was tractor drawn teller. And there was a conversation among some of the bosses to start using some rear mounts. So they went to the FDNY and we borrowed one of your spare rear mounts. And it's tough to see there, but I think there's a, they actually went over the FDNY and they yeah, had you a could picture see it. of them that said Jersey City. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You see it there? There it is right yeah. there. FDJC, Jersey wow. City. And what they did, they put this in nine truck in, in the center of the city. And they, I think we used it for three or four or five months just to see the maneuverability and if the guys liked it, you know, how the stick going up and down. Because, we, again, we were a tractor-drawn city for the longest time. And after we borrowed that from you guys, um, then everything started coming in. It was all rear mounts, rear mounts and some tower ladders. And uh, that's pretty much the fleet now. I think there's one tiller left in the city up in three truck in the third battalion wow. everything else is a couple there's two tower ladders and everything else is rear mounts and you guys helped us figure out the rear mount thing it worked out pretty cool obviously yeah yeah nice you know we skipped over chief uh when you uh took a brief hiatus from jersey city fire department you went to the fdny tell us about that story yeah oh god uh that there's a great story that goes with this um of course, I got hired at Jersey City in 81. And then 84, I took the test for the FDNY. Actually, I knew you were going to bring it up. I actually pulled out my old paperwork here. Let me just get my glasses on so I'm citing this correctly. I got hired in 84. I was in the first class off the 84 list. I'm actually looking at it here. It's, it's Department Order, City of New York, number 93. And in my class, uh, there's a couple names I know that you know. Um, let me see here. I, I think there was 150 guys in my class. I mean, I was in the same class as Kevin Shea. I, wow. I know everybody knows Kevin right out of Rescue One. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Louis Valentino. I knew Louis real well. I think Louis uh, was killed. He worked out of Rescue Two. I think Rescue he got killed two, out yeah. there in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, there's so many names here I can give you. Uh, but the long story short is this. Um, my my dream job was always the FDNY, right? So I got Jersey sitting. I took the test and I got hired in New York and I still was on, I still was on Jersey city. This is very interesting. I didn't tell this story too often because I would have gotten in trouble. Um, so what happened was I was still working in Jersey city. I got hired. I'm in the Academy at the FDNY and um, I put in for a leave. Now Jersey city, you can put in for a leave, you know, up to six months and then you can renew it for another six. And what happens is you put in for a leave and you can kind of piecemeal the leave and what they do is they freeze your salary and they freeze your pension and then you can come back if you can come back obviously in good standing so this is the funny part um my leave wasn't approved yet so i tried to put some vacation time together and some mutual swaps uh when i first was in the academy because you're obviously you're in the academy monday through friday so i didn't have any more vacation time i was working in jersey city i work a 14-hour night and I would have somebody come in early for me at six, get in my and car to, and to fly to. up to Randall's <laughs> out. And, and I would spend the day in the academy and get back at six o'clock for my night shift oh in Jersey City. God, now, I did that for a few crazy. weeks. 
But here's the funny part about it. I remember the first week in the academy. Matter of fact, uh, his captain, his son was on the job with me. Uh, Sacramento, if that makes sense, Mike. Oh, my God. I think his dad was the... <laughs> a little short guy. Yeah. <laughs> Chief Sacramento. Yeah, well, he, he I'll was... Step on your cock. Yeah. That's what well, you say. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll never forget this. The first week at the, in the academy in the FDNY, he comes into, your, into our class and he says this. If I see him one more fucking car in the parking lot that has a jersey or connecticut plate you guys are in trouble <laughs> so, so you're not you're not going to believe the story so there was like five or six of us so the next day i'm scrambling i you know i have a couple friends on the job in brooklyn and up in the bronx i get a pair of new york city new york state plates we all had to get plates now every morning we come down to the you know, before you made the turn to the left to go into the rock Underneath the bridge there, they had like, I guess, sanitation trucks were parked there. It was kind of like a little place that you it was like a little refuge place before you made the left to go into your academy. Every morning, because obviously I had the Jersey plates with Jersey registration coming from Jersey City. <laughs> Every morning we would, it was like five of us. We'd come in and we'd hide our cars into the, where the garbage trucks were. And we would change our plates at 730 in the morning. I remember like we we're bobbing up and down like gophers, making sure nobody saw us. <laughs> and this is, I mean, this is very true. You know, they were like, hey, Mike, you, I need your screwdriver. I would throw the screwdriver. They'd take their plate off. They would take the Connecticut plate off. They'd put the New York plate on. I'd take my Jersey plate off, put the New York plate on. And then drive into the academy and have a car that had a New York plate on it. And I did that for, you know, four or five weeks uh, until oh I God, made the decision crazy. that it was time to go. <laughs> oh, it was, yeah, it was, I was, so I was, I was wearing two different hats, you know, coming in and out of the Holland Tunnel, you know, one of those for a few weeks until I made so a decision. What made, what made you back. want to go it's back? Oh, uh, honestly, you have to know Jersey City. I mean, um, honestly, I, I just, I just fell in love with the department. I just thought it was a great department and simply for the reason I, I kind of mentioned earlier, we had everything. Uh, in the house I worked in, you can go within a 10 hour tour. And I'm not bullshitting when I say this. You could be in a row frame at eight o'clock. You can be in a high rise at 11. You could be in a Queen Anne at 12. You can be in a subway at one. I mean, it, it, there was so much in a small footprint that I thought I got, and I was kind of schooled to this mindset here. You can get very diversified pretty damn quick here. And see pretty much everything in a short span because we had everything in a small footprint. Uh, and again, back in the 80s, I, we were getting a lot of work. So again, I was getting a lot of experience in a lot of different buildings. And uh, believe me, and I'll just I'll finish the story because this is a great story. Um, I was so hard pressed. I'm like Jersey City, New York, Jersey City, New York, Jersey City, New York. And again, I love Jersey City, and I still do. And I'll never forget this. It was right up before we were graduating. And I had, it was a, it was a tough, I, I didn't know what to do. So I finally made the decision. I was going to resign from New York and go stay and go back to Jersey city. And I'll never forget this. And this is another story that I really don't tell too often. It was a Friday. I remember coming in the Academy a little late. The guys were doing the PT. You know, you do PT every morning and I walk into the Academy. And of course there's a lieutenant in my face screaming at me. He goes, you know, probably dark back. You know what time it is. What's your effing problem? And I said, all due respect, I'm here to resign. And, you know, he looked at me and he goes, wait here. And I'll never forget this. They brought me up to see the chief in charge of training, deputy chief. And at that time, I think I remember his name correctly. I think the chief in charge of training, FDNY in 84, his name was Detoriello, I think, if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, but this is what he did. He brought, I mean, this is a probie being brought to see a deputy chief. I, I'm, I, I could barely catch my breath when they told me I was going to see him. So this is a great story. So he brings me in his office and he sits me down. He goes, I understand you want to resign. I said, yes, sir, I do. He goes, can you explain to me why? And I, I lied and he caught me and I'll tell you what I said. I said, chief, all due respect. Um, I love being a firefighter, but I make more money as an engineer. I wasn't a fucking engineer. I made it up. <laughs> and he looked at me and this is what he said. He, I, I'm not kidding you when I say this. He leaned into this desk and he goes, he goes, an engineer? I said, yes, sir. I said, I'm, I'm going to be an engineer. I went to school to be an engineer. He goes, an engineer? I said, yes, sir. He leans back and he has my file. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally honest when I said this. He opens up my file. He looks down. He goes, an engineer? One more time. I said, yes, sir. He goes, 
I understand from what I have here, you're a fireman. You're signed to Engine 10 in Jersey City. <laughs> he called, he, <laughs> you're like, don't! I, was, <laughs> Yikes. I, I mean, I swear to God, he had me Yikes. dead. He had me dead to rights. He looks at me. He goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, Mike, he goes, don't bullshit me. He goes, tell me the reason why. And I, you know, I, I mean, I'm in tears. I'm, I'm really almost in tears. I said, chief, I said, all due respect. I don't know what to do. I said, I'm, I'm at, it's in, I love Jersey city. It's the greatest department I think in the world. He goes, well, we're pretty good too. I said, yes, I know that. And this is what he said to me. And I don't think a deputy chief would do this too often. He gave me his home phone number. He says, it's Friday. If I don't hear from you by Sunday night, he I said, I want you to call me Sunday night at my home. If I don't hear from you by Sunday night at nine o'clock, he goes, that means you're resigning. You at Monday morning, you get your ass to Brooklyn Fire Headquarters and you resign. You have until Sunday night. You can change your mind. You come back to the academy on Monday morning. Well, guys, I'm going to tell you, it was the worst weekend of my life. It was, I, did, I mean, it was the horrible worst weekend. Here I am. I'm a member of, in my opinion, of the two greatest fire departments in the world, all right, which is to me is extremely lucky, right? And here I am being asked to make a decision to pick one. And this is a deputy chief who didn't have to talk to me at all. I'm a kid. He goes, I'm going to give you till nine o'clock. Give me his home. I mean, think about it, his home number. And at nine o'clock, when nine o'clock came Sunday night, I was literally in tears you know, in my you know, in my house. And I said, I, I'm going back to where I think I could do the best in the department that I love. And I went back, and I'll tell you quite honestly, no regrets. I am I'm a Jersey guy. I'm a Jersey City fireman, and I love it. I love it. But a great department, you guys. But I had to make a decision, and I made a decision to go back home. I must have been that's torture. A, that's a true story. <laughs> it. it was horrible. Fucking horrible. Yeah, well, 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 people giving you, well, people giving you advice? <clears throat> Yes, uh, of course. I had advice from everybody. Um, I had a couple chiefs in Jersey City saying to me, you know, stay here. You're in a great house. You're going to do great. I had a couple of friends. Um, one guy in Brooklyn, uh, a good friend of mine, another mentor. He goes, Mike, come on over here. You're going to love it. You can go anywhere. Huge department, huge city, great reputation. I'm like, I can't talk to anybody anymore. You know, I'm like, what do I do? You know, yeah, I mean, right. that was even That's to the wild. point where I was starting to look at how. I mean, I, I was like torn. I was like, I was even looking at buying a house in tuxedo. I was going that far. You know, I was planning to make the move. And then, uh, I don't know, something just hit me and says, this, you belong here. You belong in Jersey. You're a Jersey kid, Jersey City. You love Jersey City. You've had this great reputation, outstanding fire department. And I, I said, okay, I made the left instead of the right. And I came back across the river and I stayed where I think I belonged. Right. It's like Nobody loving has- two women. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Add a, add a jump tail into a career. Hey. A jump tail into a career. That's let cool. me ask. Let me ask you a hypothetical, Chief. If you had stayed, if you had stayed and you graduated and you had a hook, where would you have tried to get to? Uh, that's another great question. I already had a hook. Um, a friend of mine was a captain on Brooklyn. He got me a hook, and when I bailed, he probably he probably hated me uh, because I bailed because we didn't talk too much after that. He got me a hook. I was going a forty-five truck. I, I got. I was going up to Washington Heights. That's yeah, yeah Washington Heights. Right. Ladder four yeah. five. Over. The might of the heights. Yeah, and I, and I know that's it. I know that's a pretty prestigious tower ladder. So uh, I was, I go, and that made that made the freaking decision even worse. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, forty-five truck. You know. Chief, yeah. Chief, let's be honest. That's it was the canary me. yellow rigs that kept you in Jersey City. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, I I don't think that had much to do with it at that point. <laughs> no, I'm not a big fan of yellow. I'm not a big fan of yellow. I think it was yeah, the yeah. guys and the and and the work, and I think it was the honestly, I think it was the diversity of the city in that in that small footprint. You saw a lot, you did a lot, and you learned a lot, and I think it helped my career honestly to be a better decision maker. I really do. Things happen for a reason. That's it, no doubt. Yes, sir, they do. Yes, sir, they do. They do. All right, so let's get to the part where you get promoted. Uh, now, you guys don't have lieutenant ranks; you have captain. 
Yeah, they had lieutenant ranks way back when, and for some reason, lawsuits, and they felt lieutenants did the same thing as captains, and it was, I guess it was more of a political move. We got rid of lieutenants, and now everybody's a captain. You have a captain on each shift. The captain runs the rig, and uh, that's how the captains work. And uh, you go from firefighter, captain, battalion, and deputy chief. And, uh, you know, each rank, I learned a lot, had a great time working back and forth between engine, truck, rescue, battalion, and deputy, and you know, we, you know, I met some great people on the way. Some people probably very similar to what you um, have. When I see it similar to what you have, if I can mention this guy, um, you guys might even know him. He's a probably a, a, like a Jersey City legend, but he was kind of like our Warren Fuchs. He was a guy by the name of Ira Rubin. I don't know if that name has come up in your firehouses, but he was pretty well known up and down the East Coast. And I'll just tell you a quick story about Ira because, you know, I tried to put some humor into a conversation, especially after talking about the Simone story. Um, Ira was our fire, one of our fire dispatchers. He was um, a legend in Jersey City. He was a historian. He knew everything about the job, from what firehouse was built when, the first rig, uh, you know, who was got promoted, you know, in 1981. You know, so the long story short was, Ira was a guy you could never stump. And this is a cool little story. I was a deputy chief. I Kev at the time. So um, I remember one time Ira would call me when he was on, you know, at working at fire at the fire alarm. He would call me and we bullshit. He goes, I'm like, I'm working tonight. I'm going to be on the radio. He'd be on our fire ground frequency. So I would say to him back and forth, you know, you bring a little trivia to the job every once in a while. I say, you know, I'm going to stump you tonight. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to say, if I get a fire tonight, I'm going to say something on a radio that I guarantee as much as you know about the job, the history of the fire service, whether it's, you know, a TV show, Squad 51, whatever the freak it is, I'm going to say something tonight you're never going to figure out. He goes, you'll never get me. I said, really? I said, okay, that's a challenge. <laughs> Lo and behold, I get a fire. I get a fire out in Greenville, uh, uh, second battalion, known for some good work. I get out there as the deputy, and I got a, I got two frames going, if I remember correctly. It's going into a third. So I, you know, I get on the radio because uh, I said to the aide, I said, "Let me give the, I'm going to give this report." So Iris, he's working fire alarm. I go, "Deputy one, the fire dispatch." He goes, uh, "Deputy one, what you message?" I go, um, "I go." This is what I said. I go, "I want you to ring in, ring in the second alarm for Greenville Box Seven Nine Six, two three story frames, well involved, going to a third. Conditions are remain going doubtful." He gets back on the radio. Typical, like one of your Brooklyn guys, like, beep, 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 from the deputy, ringing in second alarm, ringing in second alarm, box 796. <laughs> I get back in the quarters. This is now, I get back in the quarters, I back in, and of course, he knows I'm back in quarters because I hit the MDT to put his back in quarters. <clears throat> the phone rings. My A goes, Chief, I was on the phone. I got, I got him. I got him dead to rights. <laughs> I go, Ira, how are you doing? I go, I got you. He goes, what do you mean you got me? I said, I said, ringing in second alarm. Instead of saying the word transmitting the second alarm, I go ringing in. You'll never know. You never know where that came from. He goes, oh, really? He goes, 1974, towering inferno, Steve McQueen, battalion chief, city of San Francisco. <laughs> he used the word ringing in the second alarm. I go, you <laughs> son of a bitch. How did you, I said, how did you remember that? <laughs> and, wow. Uh, is we would is go he back, still around, We chief? would go back and forth. No, um, he passed away as well. Uh, that's another yeah, sad story. He actually passed away. Show. Yeah. Oh my God, he would be. Uh, he would love to have him on the show. Uh, he actually passed away the night we were working. Um, I'll never forget that either. You know, I'm, I'm in quarters, two or three o'clock in the morning. I'm sleeping, of course. And the aide comes in. He goes, "Something's going on." He gives me the address. He goes, "17 engine, 11 truck, and the second battalion all jumped on a medical run." I go, to an engine, a truck, and a chief on a medical run. Then I'm getting up, and then I hear another engine jumping on the same medical run. I go, what's this address? And lo and behold, it was Ira's address. So I get on the radio. I jump on it. Now I'm on my way out there, and they, you know, they call me on the uh, cell phone. They go, it's Ira. You know, he doesn't look good. I met them at the medical center, of course. Um, I walked into the ER it's just, it's just as they were pronouncing him dead. So uh, we lost yeah. him on the day I worked with them. So... Uh, but a superstar, typical, you know, one of those guys when he was on the radio, like it was just clean. It was neat. It was professional. It kind of inspired you, motivated you to, you know, say something or do something professional. Yeah. He was a, uh, 
A legend, really. Like An absolute legend. Uh, I can listen to those yeah, for hours, stories. Chief. I can listen for hours to those guys. On the radio. Oh, amazing, especially during the war years, right? The 70s and 80s for us, the war years are 60s, 70s, and 80s. And they'd be on the radio and say, listen, you're going in solo. You got nobody available. And one of those, you know, it was just like, <laughs> got it. You know, you know. Saddle up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> shit. Yeah. Yeah. Good we, stuff. I, we, we had, our, so, own, uh, we had our, own sla- our own slang. Yeah, we had some words too, like you guys, of course. So uh, you were captain of Vision Seventeen. Is that a busy place too? Before you covered in one, you, you yeah, they were 17. pretty. Yeah, Seventeen engine was sistered up with eleven truck. Um, they were on the fringes of the second and the fourth battalion on the west side of the city. Good company. Uh, a lot of taxpayers. A lot of three bricks. Um, they came into the fourth battalion on some H types, uh, some Queen Anne's on the other side. A good company. I was there. I guess three or four years before I moved out to the second battalion. I love the second battalion. Our second battalion is our southern part of the city, the Greenville area. Uh, a lot of great work out there. And still to this day, they get some decent work out there. I loved it out there. I worked out there with some great people, um, some superstars. Uh, Bobby Cobb, I don't know if that name has ever come up. Bobby's a good friend of John Salkas. I think John has probably mentioned him before. Um, I, Bobby and I got promoted to deputy together. He was a chief in the second on another shift. I worked another shift on the second. Bobby Cobb, outstanding guy. I could tell you a million stories about him, too. Um, second battalion, and then eventually I got the deputy spot and went downtown. And I ran a training division for about 18 months because there was no spots out in the street. Training division was cool. The Monday through Friday thing sucked. I wasn't a Monday through Friday type guy. <laughs> But I did, yeah. I was. I did my eighteen. I did eighteen months there. Uh, yeah, I, I I enjoyed it while I was there. I, I got some big projects going. You know, a lot of things on high rise because we had to revamp our high rise procedures. And uh, once the spot opened in the street, I went back out in the street and spent the rest of my career back out in the street. But you know, when I was there, one of the big projects was high rise, and uh, we did a lot with high rise. I'm glad I was out there for that time because we didn't really have our high rise game plan down too well. As we were a, we were a housing project for fire department. That was our high rise experience. You know, a one room burnout. You know, brick steel. Maybe she auto exposed out a window. It didn't go too far. But when our waterfront blew up, we went from 13, 14 story housing products projects to 50, 60, 70, 80 story high right, rises. Right, and uh, right, right. we didn't we didn't have a good game plan. We weren't really ready for it, and uh, we got caught a few times. I got caught one night. You know, I had a high rise under construction that didn't go well. I mean, I lucked out, but uh, spent a lot of time on high rise, and uh, I actually worked on high rise for probably a, probably five six years, and it's still an ongoing project. And I'm not there anymore, but I we're kind of like obviously we're nowhere near what you guys or Philly has, of course. But if you look across the river, it, you know, we got some high rises. We really yeah. do, and uh, hey, we've come a long way. That high rise Yeah, I do. That's when he was chief but uh one sec sorry i was writing down a question here uh yeah let's get into this high-rise fire this is this has got to be some story oh yeah on the construction what a mess yeah that was uh that was one of those you know you know little earth shattering moments to be quite honest with you that was a uh, that was a fire on 17 that that building that building now is a 55 but um that was, I mean, that's a long story short. This was a fire that started in a, like, like a 55 gallon drum. You know, like they were using it obviously to stay warm, maybe like a coke pot or something like that, you know, to help the concrete cure or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, I came down the block. It was, it was really small. It was tiny. It, was, it wasn't a big deal. I actually remember coming down the block and I told my aide. I had a lot of great aides, by the way. I had some superstars that worked with me. You know, Angelo Mano, Vinnie Kirchie, and I remember, um, you know, not Ronnie Trito, but I was working this night with uh, Johnny Martucci, and I said to him, we're coming down the block. It was a little glow, and there was already two engines in the truck in the battalion already, uh, you know, in the street. I said to my aide, I said, don't take me to the front of the building. I said, take me around all four blocks, because it pretty much was a city block, wide and long. And he goes, why? I said, I want to see all four sides. So we went around the block, and I met the battalion in the front of the building. I said to him, uh, Jimmy Pirro, I said, Jim, what do you think? He goes, Mike, it looks like a little shit fire on 12, 13, 14, 15, can't tell. 
I said, all right. I said, start the companies up. I said, I'll take the ball. And I said to Johnny Martucci, I said, we nicknamed him Tooch. I go, Tooch, I go, fill out the box. Give me everybody here in case this thing goes sideways. So, of course, you know, like anything else that goes wrong, you know, we put water into the FDC. And here, the first thing I hear is air. And I'm like, no, I mean, air. And then next thing I see is water coming off different floors. So, so obviously, standpipe valves are open. There was no construction elevator that we can access because it's nine o'clock at night, you know. So guys oh, are climbing up, and the uh, standpipe stopped at twelve, and fire was on seventeen, and it went sideways. Long story short, we um, we learned a lot. We wrote a policy and procedure on this because I couldn't find a lot of things out there from anybody on buildings under construction of height. And now it's we have a pretty kick-ass policy on dealing with high rises under construction as well as high rises residential, commercial together. So. Uh, it was the beginning of a big project that lasted for years. But the point being here is, you know, you learn from mistakes. I learned from a lot of mistakes here. And uh, this is one of those close calls again because I this thing took off and I had to get them all out of the building as fast as I could. And uh, it was another close call that I learned from. Uh, you, you learn from all your mistakes. And this was a couple of mistakes that is we that learned from. And now the department, the department's better for it. I think obviously we fixed things. Hey, we fixed a lot. Hey, of things. Chief, is that all like uh, when they used to pour the, the floors, right? They had all the uh, supports underneath. Is that all that what that is under there? Is that was that wood or what is that? Yeah, was that um, we we would earmark this as. No, no, we were earmarked this as a cast in place as compared yeah. to a steel skeleton. This was all cast in place form work with jacks, and what you got here is obviously. Uh, what they had done there, they had formed the floor on 17, but they didn't pour it, thank God. And that 55-gallon drum obviously got enhanced by the wind, hit the formwork. And the formwork, I don't to tell you, it's dried out timber that's diesel soaked because they soak it in diesel so they can use the freaking wood over and over and over again so it doesn't stick to the concrete. And uh, these guys were digging in. They were stretching up, and uh, it took off on them. And then it was one of those battles. I mean, yeah. I mean, think about this for a second. I had a fire on 17, 16, 15, dropped to 12, dropped to 10. And there was one point in time when I, have co I had companies trapped between 12 and 15 because it was burning down below them. And it was a really bad situation. Uh, we lucked out. And the point I'm making here is to anybody watching this, you, you got to learn from this shit. And you got to get out there and inspect these buildings. Because these they change every 24 hours. It's not a building that's been sitting there for 10, 15, 60, 70 years. They change every 24 hours, and they present new challenges every 24 hours. Uh, so a lot learned here. I think we're now we're I think we were uh, we are a respectable high rise city for buildings that are finished with water and buildings that are not finished with no water. So yeah, a lot of lessons there. Quite honestly. Nice. Yeah, it's good that yeah. you can learn, and 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 <clears throat> and you know there was no loss of life there, which is yeah. yeah thank God and, and then we no. have this other, this other fire here. Uh, since we're on the topic anyway, but it wasn't a high rise. Yeah, this is something. Frames. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned to you before, we got everything in our, everything in our backyard. This was, I mean, this was not my fire. I came in and relieved the chief there, another great guy that had passed away, you know, too early. Uh, I came in in the morning. This was a row of frames. I, was, I don't have to tell you about row of frames, right? Common cockloffs, shared cornices. But I remember this fire talking to the guys because I came in at, six o'clock in the morning this was yeah, everyone thinks thinks about row frames being cockloft driven and they are this freaking thing had a common basement all the way down the whole row all 10 of them and when i say a common basement it's not like you can look through one basement to see the person next door it was how the partition wall came up and how the floor joist sat on the partition wall and you can actually stick your hand up and reach over to the person next door in the in the common basement and this thing started in the basement and you know, it spread and guys were digging in. And of course it was below them when they thought it was above them. You know, it was, um, yeah, one of those things, May days out windows. Um, I just remember because, you know, it was the, of the common basement and, you know, the, and the uniqueness of a row frame, but a row frame with a common basement. I mean, yeah, you don't hear this, this is like, a, the only problem. <laughs> well, no, yeah, not only, not only problems above you have a, 
problems below your feet. So um, I remember, I think Pete Greasy, another outstanding kick-ass uh, chief out in the second. He was here at this one. I remember, I think I talked to him about it himself, eight engine. They got jammed up here pretty quick, but, you know, it was a good one. It was one of those, another one of those memorable type things that you never forget, you know. Yep. Jeez. This that is a pretty good. cool one here too. Um, but just a cool photo that uh that a local buff took, you said. Uh, I'm trying to remember this picture who gave this to me. Um it might have been a, a photographer that might have been riding with us, or I forget where it was. It was I'm trying to remember the fire. It might have been probably out in the second battalion, like everything else out in the second battalion. It might have been a scrap metal yard, if I remember correctly. It was just one of those type like of things. That, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was. I think it was. This, we have a scrap metal yard. If I think, if I'm thinking of the same place, out, yeah, you know, butts out across out to the Hudson River. This freaking thing probably burns like every other month. And uh, I think that's what this <laughs> fire was. It was just a good picture. Always, yeah, right? always, and I always. think what happens. Yeah, I think. I think. I think the. People in Brooklyn get pissed off because everything goes that way. So it's like, you know, Jersey City's got another junkyard fire. And also, yeah, another, you know, this one of those memorable type of things, you know, a picture that I had someone gave to me that I figured I'd share with you guys because you were asking for pictures. So nice. Yeah, all good. Nice, all good stuff. <clears throat> and one Real more good question. That, one question that came in from, um, from our guy, Frankie Sutphin, in the chat. He's asking about. Uh, did you know Captain Bobby Kyle in 12 Truck? Oh, yeah, sure I did. Bobby Kyle, yes. Uh, my God, I haven't talked about Bobby Kyle in a long time. Yes, he worked in 12 Truck. He worked in 10 Engine 12 Truck, the Valley of Death there way back when. Um, if I remember correctly, I think Bobby had died. Of, I think Bobby might have passed away from cancer early on, if I remember correctly. But, yeah, I know him. He was one of those you know, stellar guys, another captain, a go-to guy. When you saw a guy like Bobby coming down the street or, you know, a guy like a Jimmy Farrell or a Mark Fallon, all these guys I can remember, or the Simone brothers, it's kind of like when you saw these guys coming down the street, you had a breath of fresh air saying, mm. this thing is going to go out, going to go out. And there was a company ahead of them that was kind of like, for lack of a better word, so-so. I would look above them and I say, all right, <laughs> who's, <laughs> and I'm gonna pick up. who's behind them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm like, yeah, we're not picking anybody out of the car. I'm, like, I'm not picking any out of anybody. I'm like, uh, 22. Uh, can I talk to you for a second? <laughs> we're, in the game. We're, just, we're just looking for the 18. That's all. We're looking for oh. the 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all. Yeah. We all had those companies from way back then. We really did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, all Pete, somebody stuff, was also yeah. asking. Yeah. Somebody was asking about a Captain Barnes. I don't know if that. Uh... Oh Captain God, Barnes. Jesus God! Yes, um, <laughs> yeah, Captain Barnes, um, another great guy, uh, another line of duty guy, um, and his son is on the job. Who was a captain? Actually, he's coming here tomorrow morning at ten o'clock, and I'm he's I'm helping him study for battalion chief. Um, long story short, another childhood friend, um, Greg Barnes. Uh, he was a captain at Six Truck. But he was also a volunteer out in Wallington, New Jersey. And I never forget, I got a phone call at three or four o'clock in the morning. It was Kevin, his son, calling me. And he goes, uh, My dad just passed away at a fire in Wallington. I'm like, Oh my God. He had a heart attack, fell off the roof uh, at a fire in Wallington, New Jersey. So, of course, you know, I was very close with the family. I shot out there right away. And I met up with his, his wife, Patty, his sons, John and Kevin. And I, you know, I got assigned to the family for the week. You know, I was, you know, the liaison between the fire department and the family for the funeral. Uh, a tremendous line of duty death funeral. I mean, excuse me, we had thousands of people, literally thousands of people. And this is a number of years ago. He was, he was a fireman's fireman, this guy. Great guy, close friend of mine. Yeah, I miss him to this day. <clears throat> and his son, and this is the worst part of the story. There's, there's two parts of the story. It was bad enough that Greg had passed away, but his son, John, um, who wanted to be a Jersey City fireman in the worst way, he died a year after his dad did from cancer. Uh, and that was another funeral we had to go to. Uh, oh, he was a God. volunteer at Wallington. He was, he, he was on the list 
for Jersey City. He would have been hired, but he passed away a year after his dad did. And uh, I mean, you talk about being heartbroken. You talk about the Simones. Well, here I'm talking about the Barnesses now. And, uh, you know, I looked at Kevin as like, I'll get emotional, like an adopted son, because I don't have any sons. I have two I have two daughters, and I love my daughters to death. But I look at Kevin, I'm like, you know, your dad is so proud, your brother's so proud, and you're a captain, you're going to be a chief. And, um, you know, like the type of people, the type of family, and I know, I know you guys know what I'm talking about, that you, you break bread with, you're at the kitchen table, you talk fire all day, all night, you talk about everything is fire, fire, fire. <laughs> and when you lose people like that, the value that they would bring to the table is kind of like, oh, it's it's heartbreaking. But yeah, Kevin Barnes is coming tomorrow. I'll help him out. But his dad, um, Greg Barnes, we lost him a number of years ago. Uh, another tough story, but a, a good story. Meaning the family is, is is keeps giving back to the fire service like the Simones do. They really don't. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, again, that's the same exact scenario, like you just said. Now, here's a kid who's going to be a chief in in the same department, you know, yeah. that his dad yeah. was. I mean, how much more proud can yeah. you be, you know, you know, you know, the old man's looking down at him. So it's good stuff. Oh, yeah. About Blue, it's the same thing. It's tradition, man. It's enough to tell you. FDNY, you're loaded with it. Jersey City is loaded with it. And uh, it's something that keeps us alive, motivated and pushing forward and family keeps bringing family in that's the way it should be obviously it has to be you know and uh, yeah. i'm proud to say i'm a part of that you know on the jersey side of course but yes no, very that's happy. Good. yeah that's great chief, chief let's talk about yeah, the, uh, the 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 promotional prep classes that you run when did you start that there's a lot of guys oh, reaching out to me about what a great class it is and they, they use it to uh to get promoted so Okay, Kev, you did your homework. Holy shit. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what I wanted to do, you know, after I learned the trade and I learned how to dovetail the engine and truck. Oh, I got to um, dovetail. I got to do something here. Real Yo. Quick. I'm sorry. Whoa. Hey. Are you guys pick, pick, wow. Wow. I'm just, I got to remind you guys about the word here. Um, <laughs> I got to fill um, my glass. <laughs> Uh, after I learned the trade, I thought I learned the trade as engine and truck firefighter. And of course, you never fully learned the trade. I said, oh, now I think I'm ready. It's 10, 12 years as a firefighter. I said, now I'm ready to learn the promotional side. So learn how to study, learn how to read, how to pull intel out, learn how to do the written exam. Jersey's a little big on oral assessments. I learned how to play that game and it had some bumps in a row, but learned, it, learned that particular part of the service pretty well. And now, you know, as as a former deputy and guy who went through the process all the way up the rank, now I have the ability to, you know, share some information to help some guys out on how to perform on the written, but more notably how to do the oral, because we're big on oral assessments here on the Jersey side. And you got to handle scenarios that are, you know, your first do, you're coming in, and what's, you know, what are your strategy and tactics, or you get the May Day, or you get a loss of water, or you get a collapse, the power pill wall's got a fracture in it, what do you do, as well as dealing with questions that have to do with supervisories, what a tr trouble subordinate and all the dynamics that go with problem solving and analyzing things. So, uh, yeah, I've kind of, uh, I've been working with a couple of great friends, uh, Frankie, so, uh, Frankie Montaigne out of North Hudson and Al Pratt's. Uh, I work with those guys in promotional prep and uh, we've got a great little business. And not only do we help with Jersey guys, we got guys up and down the East coast. We actually have tutored guys as far out as believe it as you can imagine out in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, the no moral shit. assessment so it's pretty much I, yeah it's how you play the game it's you know the, the funny part about it when they give you a scenario you know it's not real but you have to verbalize keyword verbalize things and have clarifying statements and making sure you're getting things done search rescuing removing and cutting pulling and pushing ceilings and coordinating the glass with the water you got to say these things you know so it's kind of like a game but at the same time there's still a skill set that goes with the promotional assessment and uh I've been doing it for probably 20 some years. Have a lot of fun. It's cool. It keeps me in the books. I'm reading. I got all, I mean, I got every book known to man in this office here because I got to read like I'm taking that freaking test all over again. So <laughs> keeps me, uh, keeps me current with all the different books. And we use Let's a lot of New York that's, books. That's why we I do a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, wait, I, got a, I got a scenario for the oral part. All right. I have a scenario here. All right. You're a chief. 
and you have a lieutenant who refuses to do BI, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Oh boy. Well, I'm not I'll, saying I'll, that's true. Okay, I'm I'll asking tell you what, for a friend. Just ask it for a friend. <laughs> well, you can, you can, I can go the formal route and you say you could use this progressive discipline thing on, you know, an oral written or reprimand. Maybe you want to go write the suspension here. I'm not really sure. Pending a hearing, maybe I would go that route. Uh, <laughs> uh, come on. on. And, and Chief, just another quick question. If that same lieutenant stuck his finger in your chest because you uh, reprimanded never, him, how would you never, how would you handle that? Never. Chief, I would never disrespect. I was never Chief, disrespect. If you if you never. finger poked the deputy. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you made look at I his think, face. Look at the cheap space. <laughs> I think maybe more than a lifting is in in uh, order. I'm just saying. Yes, Dick. Never. Oh. <laughs> never. Never. I never did that. You never. Guys. I'm just. This is all I, I, theoretical. I, I, if I can hey, say, Pete, we're asking for a friend. I was, yeah. I would. I would say you take care of this uh, on the apparatus floor, if you know what I mean, when nobody else. Oh, oh, oh maybe go. Maybe oh. ask that lieutenant down to the basement. Yeah. I don't That's know. old Just school. That's yeah. old school. Maybe the chief said, "Yeah." And then, and then, the chief says, "Go home and get your fucking shine." Box. <laughs> yeah. Something to that effect. Maybe you both go down there and you do one of these. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Come on, put them up. Put them up. No. Oh my gosh! All right. Yes. Great idea. Great idea. Oh, I like it. Where am I at? Oh, well, all right, all right. So, uh, citywide tour commander, that's the last on your list. Yep. Yet. Is that how you went out as yep. a citywide tour commander? Yeah. You did, yeah. Um, uh, I went out as a citywide tour commander, and um, I was, I think I was 50, I'm 62 now, I think I was 57 at the time. And I, I remember, I, I, I never wanted to retire, you know, I, I still I missed the job, of course, like most people don't. But I was, you know, someone said to me, an old chief. He said to me, he goes, "You'll know when you know about retirement." I go, I go, what does that mean? He goes, "You'll know when you know." And a long story short, I was, um, I was a citywide boss. I was very involved, of course, doing adjunct work on the high rise thing, as I mentioned earlier. And um, I never forget the day I was in the firehouse. We were, you know, not a busy day, but enough of activity. And I was at the academy doing some high rise stuff because I would do it on my days when I was working for my shift. And I came back to the firehouse and um, it's about four o'clock. Another story I don't tell too often. And I walked into the kitchen. The guys were making dinner. And I remember getting a cup of coffee and I sat down and my whole face on the left side went numb. And I go, oh, this is not good. And uh I worked my way back to the office and I sat down at my desk and my aide came in, Ronnie Trito, and I said something to him and my words were slurred. And uh, that was the end. I mean, he pretty much, uh, he, the next thing I know, there's a million people on top of me. I met the medical center and I had, a, I had a little stroke while I was working. So, you know, we got that fixed. Everything got back to normal and um, went through all the testing and of course they found some issues i had some i had to get some i got to have had they had a carburetor rebuilt for lack of a better word so uh, the doctor said to me he goes yeah we got to get this done uh in the next you know four or five months i say can i go back to work and he looked at me like i was on medication <laughs> and I, I was on medication of course <laughs> No, but the good stuff. <laughs> and he said to me, you have the good stuff. And he said to me, why do you want to go back? I said, he goes, you need open heart surgery. I said, um, can I get four or five months to go back and finish the high rise program? And I had to explain to him what the high rise program was. He goes, you can go back. He goes, but you got to be back here in July because we got to go in and fix everything. So I went back to work on blood thinners and all that shit. And I, I finished the high rise program. Had the surgery, uh, was out for three months, and I went back to work again. But six months later, that guy that said to me, you know when you know, I knew it was time to go. It was, you know, I was back. Uh, I had everything fixed. Everything was replumbed. They fixed the hole in the heart and all the crap that I had the problems with. But it was, yeah, it was a tough, another tough day. I remember saying to my wife, I go, I know it's time for me to go. It's, it, it's time for me to leave because I, I'm done. And I left. And. You know, it's like one of those things where I say, you know, 
you probably talked to people about this before. It's like, thank God I had something to fall back on, meaning I had the ability to, you know, to teach or share a story or do a PowerPoint and do a class because I probably wouldn't have done well leaving, you know, a profession that I loved. So another tough day, but left and um, no regrets and uh, I missed the job and missed the people, but I can go out and share a story. And, you know, that's where I was. I was in, I was in Cherry Hill, New Jersey for the last few days. Cherry Hill guys and gals, great people was down there. Actually, I left there at four o'clock, drove two hours to get here in time to see you guys. <laughs> Cherry Hill with some surrounding morning. cities. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember when you called me in the morning and um, some Philadelphia guys came over. So um, thank God I have the ability to go back and pull out a picture, talk about a story, something that went well, something that didn't go well because, um, it would have been tough not doing this and cutting grass all day or doing something stupid like that. So yeah, it keeps me alive. But it was, it, my point being, you'll know when you know. And I knew when I knew it was time to sign the paper. And four months, I mean, four months, four weeks later, I was gone. But wow. a great career. A uh, couple bumps in a row. Met some tremendous people. I mean, well, I mean, to this day, some outstanding people like you guys. Guys, do you could I, mean, I can talk to everybody by name, a million people by name, but. I'm so honored to be a, a member of the department. I, I mean, I am ridiculously honored to be on this program. I look at the people you have had on this program, and you ask me, I'm like, wow. So, thank you. <laughs> you're the man. Thank That's why. Because you're the man. Have you? You know what he is, Pete? He's the Jersey City. <laughs> Bye. Hey. Uh, <laughs> you're the Jersey City goat. He's the Jersey City goat. There you go. You know, you know what, Chief? We say that all the time. The fact that you know, uh, Coobs and I, we had started this thing, uh, not the podcast, but we had started like a shirt thing, maybe like five or six years uh, back, and then I retired in nineteen, end of nineteen, and then he, you know, broke my balls to do this, and I, I really, honestly, I. And I'm not too crazy about that type of stuff, but it really keeps me connected. And I don't feel like I miss the, the yeah. job because I'm doing this. And it's probably similar to you because, you know, you're teaching and you, you know, you, you're seeing the guys and you're talking it up all the time. So, you know, I can't imagine if I didn't have any, you know, if like you said, if I was just cutting grass or just doing something that wasn't related to the firehouse at all, I think it would really probably bother me. It really would. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I think it would bother everybody that probably's on this podcast because everybody you know listens to this for the same reason. We're all you know born and bred into this. This is a passion. It's a calling. And it's a profession. It's not a business. I never say that. This is not fire service. Not a business. It's a it's a profession. Um, yeah, I mean, if we all, I mean, I this is from the time I was 15, 16 years old, and here I am, 62, and I, I, I mean, I love to talk about this stuff. I love to read about an article or look at something on social media that somebody's posting. I mean, it's still in me. I just can't be in front of a building anymore, sadly. But yeah, I mean, thank God I have the ability to do this, talk to guys like you, and you know, share a story or two. Because otherwise, who the hell knows where you'd be? You know, you know, you just don't know. You just don't know. Thank God for that. Really, I mean that sincerely. Thank you. And you, you got some good stories. To, uh, you can stories. come back to our kitchen table anytime, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta be kidding me. I love the kitchen table. Probably the best place yeah. to exchange some stories, right? Yeah. Oh, my you're talking, God. You're talking oh, good. to a guy who, uh, who for two hours watched a, a YouTube show that a guy has of just fire trucks responding down the street. <laughs> two hours. I sat there for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> like, most of it was uh, L.A. and Wisconsin, but just it was just the fire trucks pulling out of the firehouse and going down the street. I watched two hours straight of it. I'll tell yeah. you something. I'll tell you something. Ever Sick since death. I started, ever since I started this show, I can't help but stop when I see a truck coming out. Like who? Ooh, who's turning out? Oh, who's? That? Oh, oh wow. Oh, is it squad? Is it squad two eighty eight? Patty, Patty Lee says oh, sorry, I, re I retired because too many Italians came into the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that was my that was my lieutenant. No, no. So he he knew when he knew. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everybody knows when they know. They got their own little tipping mechanism there, right? I got you. I got you. Loud and clear. I hear you. Who's too much that? chicken palm. That's the problem. Too many. Too much veal <laughs> palm from Louis. <laughs> oh All right, God. Pete. That might be that time, Pete. Oh, you know what? I think it is time for. It is time What's for that? the old school tip of the day, which is brought to you by the Burn 
box.com. That's right. It's a firefighter subscription box. The burn box celebrates firefighter products and firefighter owned and operator businesses. Subscribe now and receive a monthly box of firefighter apparel, gear, and tools. Use code getting salty, the burn box.com. You know right. what I love, Pete? You know yeah. why I love that? Mystery <laughs> box. I love the mystery. I love a mystery box. <laughs> There's nothing better than a mystery box. I love a mystery box. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Never know what you're <laughs> Okay. All right. Enough. All right. All right. All right. The best part of the show, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the old school tip of the day. 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 Take it away, Chief. Oh, God, old school tip of the day. Uh, I remember when you guys told me to be prepared for this. So what I pretty much put out in my you know, my thought process here is I probably – I think I got one for the engine truck in chief, if I can do that, if that's acceptable. Um, I'll start with the chief. And I was actually talking about this with the Cherry Hill and Philly guys today. Um, as a new battalion chief, one thing I learned early on is get, get the line stretched in flowing water. Get the first line, in my point – tip of the day is get that first freaking line stretched in flowing water. And even if you have to throw a second engine or a third engine on, depending on your staffing issues, uh, get the line stretched and flowing to the point where, and I'll say this tongue in cheek, but I'll be a little blunt. I go, why in the name of Christ would you start the second line if you're not ensured that the first line is going to get where it needs to go? And I'm not talking about a two-story frame, 20 by 40 with the fire in the first floor to the left of the bedroom. I'm talking about something that's maybe on the upper floor, a little bit deep in the building, multiple dwelling, an H type, whatever it may. Get your resources on the first line. Get it moving and flowing water. Because if you put the fire out, guess what? All of your other problems will go away. All right? Um, if I could throw something at the truck, um, we were talking about this today also. Um, Jersey City, we got a lot of flat roofs, and um, sometimes you can't do the old thing that everyone says, the multi-sided 360-degree view, because you just can't get around all the buildings. There's too many in a row. Maybe they're deep. They're set back. So we play this little thing called a roof report. You know, the truck looks over the back, and they tell you what they see. So I would say to the truck guys, when you look over the back, um, think about what you're going to say before you say it on the radio. Perfect example, we were bullshitting about this today, is don't say to me it's heavy in the rear. That means nothing to me. Is it heavy fire or smoke in the rear? Better, but how about something a little bit more definitive, all right? Thinking about what you say before you key the mic, how about like this? Fire out three windows, top floor rear. I think that's a little bit better than it's heavy in the rear. I mean, tell me what you see. Same thing with a person hanging out the rear window. I don't know, this has actually happened to me. Um, a lady hanging out the rear. Now, if she's on the third floor or fourth floor window cell, all right, and you don't know that, you respond to a lady just hanging out the rear report, and you bring back a 24-foot ladder, I think she's going to be a little pissed off because your ladder didn't reach her on the third or fourth <laughs> floor window cell. So, again, for the truck, think about what you're going to say, all right, and, and, and be a little bit more definitive. Your words make a difference. And finally, I know we kind of talked about this before um, a little bit on the inside with the engine, and I think this is important too. That second engine, all right, not the first, because the first is going to work on the fire floor. Second engine, boss, keep the stair clean. Um, if the first engine is stretching up to the fourth floor, keep that floor space between four and three clean. Keep the stairs clean. And when you're needed to go up, all right, you go up, all right, and control that staircase. Keep it clean because... You know, I don't know this concept, but well, there's always a firefighter assigned to every step. It's like the conga line. And when the <laughs> shit hits the fan, you know, you know, and you got to dive over these freaking guys, and it's needless. So second engine, boss, let the first engine get the line up there. And, uh, you know, the officer sneak up, sneak down. When it looks like they need work or relief, then bring your company up and then keep the stairs clean for that oh shit moment. It's probably my three old school tips of the day for the chief the truck and the engine. Hopefully that helps one or two people out there. I hope. But yeah, thanks. I had fun with that. I love that. It's always the squad on the fucking stairs too. Always, always, <laughs> always, bro. <laughs> Jamming shit up, you know? Pete, you know what you gotta give him for that one. What's that? Uh, uh, <laughs> good one, Chief. Thank very, you very nice, much. Chief. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Cool. Great. Great. 
Yeah. <laughs> Had a great time. Great, thank you. Really good. I love learning about new different departments. But you know what? No matter where it is, man, the love for the job is the same. Firemen just love their yeah, job. Absolutely. Yep. Yes, they All do. All right, Rookie, really, you got any shout really outs, do. fella? Uh, I do not. I actually had one. I, I forgot to send Petey the, uh, the pictures. It was, uh, uh, what the heck was his name? Beckwith. Beckwith. He was the, the gentleman, uh, the firefighter who was, uh, took the picture with, uh, President Bush at the time at nine 11. Yeah. Remember President Bush had his hand. Yeah, yeah. He, he just had, turned he the megaphone. He, he just turned 90. He was in one seventeen. Beckwith was his last Word. name. I forget, Bobby Beckwith. I forget what his first name is. Patty Lee's probably tell me what the heck his name was. Yeah. But uh, they had some pictures of him today. He turned uh, or yesterday he turned ninety. Bobby. So Bobby yeah. Beckwith, yeah. Yep, right. yep. I think there was a guy in the FDNY who just retired from Forty Truck too. Had uh, 35, 36 years something on the job. Of yes, I did see that too. I did yes. see that. That's a good okay. thing about that fan page. They send us a lot of stuff on there that I don't would not normally see. Yeah, we got to get that guy on the shelf for the thirty five years and forty truck. Hmm. Let's do it. Probably seen a, seen a thing or two over there. Yeah, all right. So uh, Monday, you know, it's going to be a hard act to follow up with the chief, but we have the firehouse dolls, calendar girls on. I don't know if that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to make it. We'll try to make it work. All right. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and uh, after that, me and Ruffy were off. We're on the road with little Cliffy Harris. Who might be somebody asked me if Cliffy was shorter than me today. Is Cliffy shorter than me? He might be. He's uh, rounder than me. I don't know if he's shorter. I don't know. He's more square than round, I think. Yeah, he's square. All right. We'll be heading out to Indy. So we won't be back until the following week. Uh, and who do we have? I don't know who we got. We, we got, got Chief somebody. Dunn that week. Chief Dunn on the that. fifth. He's yeah, back. we got Chief Dunn on the fifth. He's back. And we got the uh, I don't know. We got a whole bunch of people. Don't worry. All right, Pete. Uh, Pull up, hold on, I'll pull up the uh, calendar right now. Don't threaten me with a good mm. time. Let's see. Uh, you know what? Uh, yep. Uh, Paul, Chief Paul. Car oh, Chaos, Chaos Carry. Chaos Carry. Chaos Carry coming on. On Monday the 2nd. On Monday the 2nd. And Vinny the Dunn on Cinco de Mayo. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah that's oh, we, we have the show on Cinco de Mayo. I got to bust out my Mexican hat, bro. <laughs> Yeah, oh. I love that. You're gonna appropriate the culture? Oh my god! My I'm just gonna word. do a lot of this. C. I, mean, C. I will not. I will absolutely not play the Mexican hat dance over and <laughs> over on. and over and over. Not at all. All right, all. listen, the chief. Chief, just hang loose with us for a couple minutes. We're just gonna yeah. close out, and then uh, we'll yep. uh, we'll come off live, and we'll uh, say our goodbyes in the back. Okay. Do it, great right, guys. Thank yep. You. Yep, yep, yep. All right, guys, if you're uh, watching, you should also be listening to the audio-only version of this podcast on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, on all the players. And while you're there, maybe hit that uh, subscribe button. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to even like it anymore. I'm just taking all the other just things subscribe away subscribe already. Just subscribe. This, I just found out I think there's 34 or plus thousand in the uh, fans page. Come on! Subscribe, all of you. That's the mission tomorrow. I'm gonna all right, here's it. the mission. If we get to thirty thousand, we'll get Pete in the burn building at the Rock, all right, and we'll film it. I, I, like have, that. I have to shave, but I'll keep a dirty little porn mustache for that. Yeah. That's what we'll do. All, all right. right. Yeah. Uh, and guys, if you're here at YouTube.com forward slash getting salty experience again, like, <clears> subscribe, <throat> and share. I'm gonna keep hammering it home. We got to grow this show. Instagram, guys, if you're on there, find us at Salty Dog Inc. The coolest, freshest fire photos in the game. Salty, old school, crusty, vintage. That's what we're all about. Guys, getting salty apparel.com. That's one way we pay the bills. All the freshest firefighter apparel uh, and accessories in the game. We got a new hat, a uh, new hat, new t shirt coming out. Follow the smoke. Uh, where do you work? Just follow the smoke. It's going to be a banger. I can tell you that much. So look out for that. Thank you to everybody who hit us up in the super chat. Again, guys, also Facebook, if you're on there, go to the Getting Salty Fans page. That is totally, totally, totally free as well. We don't run it, but uh, you crazy fans do, and it is awesome. It's becoming its own global fire wire, so check it out. Uh, if you guys want to advertise with us, gettingsaltyads at gmail.com. Okay, I'll uh, shoot us an email about your interest to advertise. I'll give you my spiel. Uh, guys, gettingsaltyexperience at gmail.com. If you have uh, questions for our Q&A shows, we're trying to uh, maybe do another couple of those. Uh, 
folks, coobspodcast at gmail.com for our cocklofts and cocktails and cup of Joe and Fuego shows. That's all your rig photos, uh, fire photos, helmet cam footage, um, all your fun stuff like that. Shoot it over there, the hottest wives contest, all that good stuff. Uh, and I guess that's uh, <laughs> Chief, like, what am I doing I just here? I, the chief's face. I love his reaction. I didn't even get the last one, so I'll, I'll, he'll, he'll love this one. So I finally found a company that will uh screen print, uh, no, it'll screen print our uh underpants that we're getting the uh boxer oh. briefs with the pull box by the junk that says pull in case of emergency. So those will be coming. <laughs> Those will be coming soon. I finally got a guy. We'll send, who, we'll send you a pair, Chief. Can you believe? Can you believe Chief, I, it's, it's an honest living. Oh, please. It's an yes. honest living. I, I could not get a company that would print uh, stuff on the on the junk part of the underwear. So I finally found one. So oh we'll be getting them out soon. Right. See what I'm dealing with, Chief? Uh, <laughs> it sells. I tell you, it sells. It well, sells. That, all right. We'll see you. We'll see you with the. We'll see you with Matt Gum and the ladies from the Firehouse Dolls on Monday night. Have a great weekend. If I don't see you, stay low and go. Chief, it was a pleasure. Really enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. See you thank big, you so much. See you, everybody. Hey, hang on, Chief. We'll see you at the big one. All right. Cheers, everybody.